You try to build software where you don't deeply understand the problem or you don't deeply understand the customer, you're never going to succeed because you'll always be one step behind a competitor that does. I, I didn't want to just be like a Facebook ads monkey anymore. If I can just stack up enough money to start a software company, I think that's where I'll make mm -hmm. the real money. All three of my software companies have just been productized APIs. I always knew that I wanted to do something in software. That's where the highest leverage is. Yeah. You can sell the same thing over and over and over again. You get 10, 15 X multiples on you know the value of your company. Building no code software companies or just productizing an API, selling them on acquire.com, they're making millions of dollars a year. It's not hard to start a software company in this day and age. These large language models have APIs. If I were to start a SaaS company, for the very first time in 2023, I would. Welcome to the We're Gonna Make It podcast, where we talk about the nitty gritty tactics that underground entrepreneurs are using to build their businesses to the seven and eight figures. The goal of this podcast is to go into excruciating detail on the tactics and strategies that they're using right now. So hopefully you can implement it into your business and see more success. If you like tips like this, you can always subscribe to our free newsletter. But other than that, please enjoy the episode. Kieran, I guess Kieran O'Brien, my longtime friend, I suppose, yeah. at this point. But brother, you have sold two software companies in what, the last 18 months? Yeah, yeah, roughly 18 Dude, months. Incredible. And it's cool because you've done two different kinds of software. You have like a typical software company, and then you have like a micro SaaS. Yeah. And Iman got what? Iman actually ended up buying the yeah. micro SaaS. Yeah, he did. So that's a cool story I want to get into later in the podcast. Sure. Let's start with media kits because that was the big one for you. Now, yeah. for legal reasons, guys, you know I love to ask how much money people make right out the gate, but Kieran signed a contract. He can't talk about it, yeah. but he's doing well. Let's just say that, and he had tens of thousands of users, so do the math. But yeah. basically, what was media kits? How did you come up with the idea? And just tell me all about that. Yeah, so mediakits.com was basically like, it was a SaaS platform for data and analytics for influencers and online creators. And so basically it would take all the APIs of the popular social platforms and it would put all your analytics into like a one pager that you would then use to connect with brands. Mm. So we had some of the biggest influencers in the world, celebrities using our product, and they would basically take their, their link with all their analytics. And you know, when an influencer goes to a brand and they want to do they want to promote the brand, they want to do a shout out or get paid for, for something like that. Um, typically they would always go to their analytics and take screenshots. Mm -hmm. And so we kind of saw that that was an outdated process and wasn't, it wasn't very scalable and the, the analytics always get outdated. And so we basically just built like a really clean UX around some APIs and um, turned it into a, a product that ended up going really viral on TikTok and Twitter and some other places. So basically people, like influencers, would try to get sponsors to yeah. make money, to monetize their exactly. audience. Exactly, yeah. And so they had a really hard time. Sponsors would want to know how many views do you typically get, yeah. how many followers do you have, comments, engagement, Age and, age and gender breakdown, geographic location mm -hmm. of your followers, all of that. And there's really no easy way to find that information. There's a bunch of tools online that, that scrape that information and, and guess it, mm -hmm. but nobody knows that information accurately other than the platforms themselves. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have to go to the source. And then the next issue beyond that is it's on a per platform basis. Mm -hmm. So if you're a brand and you want to pay an influencer for a shout out on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, those are all different companies yeah. that don't talk to each other, that don't share data between each other. Yes. And so you'd have to go and screenshot your analytics on each of those platforms one by one hmm. to be able to give the brand a view into that. And that makes a lot of sense because they'd only want a video on maybe TikTok for this specific campaign. Right. right? Okay. Yeah. And then another thing you mentioned when I was watching your video, guys, check out his channel. He makes a lot of great YouTube content on this, Kieran O'Brien. But you, in that video, you were talking about not only were they struggling to even get it, but it constantly is changing because every month yeah. your views are different. Exactly. And so you guys kept it live updated with the APIs. Exactly. Every day, every week. Um, you know, people were going in and updating their media kits previously, like before our product, people would use Photoshop or Canva or something like that. And they would be going in there, updating it every single day, mm -hmm. every single week in a lot of cases. Like graphic designers, full-time job, right? Exactly. There. So they, they would have graphic designers mm -hmm. on staff. A lot of the talent agencies that we worked with, so we had a B2B model too, where we'd sell, uh, bulk, oh, smart. yeah, we'd sell bulk seats to talent agencies. That's oh, actually shit. where we made most of our revenue. Yeah. Um, and so like they would have full-time graphic designers on staff just updating media kits, <laughs> yeah. like changing ones to twos and threes to fours. And mm -hmm. it was just ridiculous. And then the individual creators, they would have freelancers that they'd hire to do like graphic design to update their media kits, or they'd be doing it themselves. And it would take them hours and hours every single week. So, I mean, ultimately the product just solved the problem that was painful enough for people to be willing to pay for it. Okay. So two things I want to point out here. One, you're just referencing that you're using APIs. So I feel yeah. like a lot of people overcomplicate software. 
Can you just explain like what an API is and how you can wrap that into a software company? Yeah, absolutely. So an API is basically uh, data structures that a company will make public um, to, to their own platform. So most large technology companies have APIs where sometimes they're gated and you have to apply for them, um, but sometimes they're public. Mm -hmm. And basically you can tap into these, uh, these endpoints in, in these APIs and you can pull valuable data. So for example, uh, Meta's API, which we used for media kits, mm -hmm. had things like you know, follower count and gender uh, breakdown and geographic breakdown and you know, follower growth over time and all these things. And so we would use those APIs. We'd make API calls through our application to grab that data and use it in our product. And so you know, same thing with, with the company that I sold mm -hmm. to Emon. It was just an API that we put into a really nice user experience from a CRM product that didn't have a very good reporting dashboard. And so we built a reporting dashboard for this CRM and productized it. And then my new SaaS company too, we're mm -hmm. taking APIs and productizing it. So, you know, I always tell people starting a SaaS company, starting a software company, you don't, you do not need to know how to code. You do not need to come up with the next Facebook. It can be something as simple as a no code, uh, simple, clean UX that just takes an API and productizes it. You said endpoints and data structures. I just want to clarify for everybody. Basically, if you have a Twitter API and you tweet, you can connect the API to your own software, and the tweet on Twitter will show up in your software. Right? Exactly. Yeah. That, super that's super simple. Yeah, that's one example of it. Yeah. And so all you have to do is find like a specific use case of that information, and then brand it and market it towards that demographic that has that problem. Yeah. And you can sell your company for a lot of money, essentially. Exactly. And I get I, another simple way to break it down would be like companies have APIs to make the user experience for their users better. And so we'll use the Twitter example that you just gave, right? So Twitter has all this data but they're not using it in every single possible way that you can use that data, right? Twitter's using it to create a social platform, right? And so making their API public allows developers and you know, people like us mm -hmm. to go and build software companies that solve like more niche problems around that same data. So let's say you know, Twitter's really focused on just building a social platform and they're not as focused on helping creators get brand mm -hmm. deals. So somebody like me can come along and build mediakits.com and take the Twitter API and use that data to extrapolate even more data and like make inferences and, and create uh, you know, different data based off of the, the parent data, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So we'll find trends in the data that Twitter doesn't even- Like hyper-specific. Exactly. And then we'll use that to build a product that allows Twitter influencers to get brand deals, right? And that's not something that Twitter is gonna build themselves but they give all that data away to the public to make, to make life easier for their users. Like, why wouldn't they want somebody who's a Twitter influencer to be making exactly. more money? It'll keep them on the platform exactly. longer. So, you know, these platforms that have APIs are incentivized to open source them to developers and entrepreneurs to make even more specific products around them. It sounds really complicated, but it's truly really simple. Yeah. And the APIs exist for that reason. Exactly. They public, like make them publicly available so people like you can use them for your own software, your own use case, because yeah. it makes their platform better. Exactly. And it's called an API key. You just have to go to their website, apply for one, copy, paste. Yep. Just like that, you have API. So you know these APIs exist, but how did you come up with this idea? Like you don't just know that you need media kits if you've never been in the industry. So how yeah. did you come up with the idea in general? Yeah, so the crazy story about media kits is I came up with the idea when I was 17, when I was in high school, and then I didn't actually start the company until almost four years later. Mm. And so, yeah, that's what a lot of people think that like, you know, that we just came up with this idea and then we, we Wait, built so you it had and the launched idea it. Four years before you like started it? Yeah, and so I'll give you, I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, there, there's actually two reasons. So the first reason, is basically I just didn't know what I was doing and I knew that and I was like, I'm not going to start a software company mm. because I don't have enough money and I have no idea what I'm doing. I don't even know where to start. Mm. Um, and, and that's totally, totally a valid thing. And, you know, maybe I could have started and who knows what would have happened if I started the company back in 2017. But um, the other reason is that I just felt like the market wasn't ready. So influencer marketing kind of blew up in like 2015, 16 with the rise of Instagram. And then there was kind of this lull from like 2017 to 2018 and what really brought back the creator economy and kind of created this new resurgence of, um, you know, of, of activity in, in that industry was TikTok. And so I noticed that, and that's, that's why we launched Media Kits kind of at the, at the very early stages of 2020. Like during COVID, everyone's locked, locked down at home. Mm. They're on their phones, TikTok blows up. That's when, you know, like Charlie D'Amelio, Addison Rae, all these TikTok influencers kind of blew up. And that's when we started Media Kits because we kind of saw that trend and we're like, okay, 
the influencer economy is back. We have an idea for a tool. Now we have you know, the resources mm -hmm. and the connections to actually make this work, so let's do it. So that's where you saw the timing, yeah. which is super important because there's so many stories. I know there's a company that had like a, almost like an iPhone-esque level phone in the early 2000s. Yep and they invested millions of dollars into it, but it was just too early. The apps, the like, ecosystem, internet, mobile internet was horrible, so yeah. it just didn't work. But 10 years later, when Steve Jobs rolls it out, it's a hit, even though the technology really wasn't much different. So that's a really interesting insight, and I loved hearing that. But how did you actually come up with the idea? How did you identify yeah. that problem? Because with influencer marketing, there's like 20 different steps that go into it, and I think you did a really good job of identifying like one clunky pain point and then hyper-focusing on that. Yeah. So do you wanna go into how you identified that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when I was 17, I was running a marketing agency and oh, I was damn. I was helping. And when I say that, I don't want that to sound intimidating to anybody because it was literally just a glorified freelance business. Mm -hmm. Like I was running Facebook and Google ads and helping with influencer marketing for like mm -hmm. three, three businesses. Mm -hmm. And so one of them was a company that sold auto parts online. Mm -hmm. And so they had a budget for influencers and they wanted to try to, you know, to spend this budget on some mm -hmm. on some influencers and one of my best friends uh jr garage has a big automotive youtube mm. channel right and there. so yeah he's right down the street and i was basically connecting my client with him to do this brand deal and okay. they were like well can we see his insights can we see his data and mm. uh they they actually specifically asked for a media kit and when they said that i'm like i have no idea what a media yeah. kit is like let me just google this real quick i'm like what is a media kit it's like oh it's like a it's like a page like a one pager with all of your analytics and data huh. and media kits are actually before the whole influencer marketing thing uh, existed even before social media media kits have been used for decades in uh, the, the journalism space mm -hmm. so newspapers print magazines traditional media they've always used media kits to showcase like their their monthly readers and stuff mm -hmm. like that and so media kit was a very popular term in, in the journalism yeah. space okay. and it started getting adopted in the influencer space at the time and so I'm online, I'm like, oh cool, like, yeah, let me just go make a, a media kit for JR real quick. There's gotta be a website that just does this for you. Mm -hmm. Like, of course, duh. It's like the most obvious thing ever. Yeah. I'm like looking around, I'm like, there isn't. Like, why, why does this not exist? And so, hmm. you know, that's, I actually did kind of start media kits back then. Like I, I got the domain. I actually even did I was some, ask about that. yeah, I did some mock-ups. I got the Instagram handle, got the, got the, uh, the web domain did some initial UI mock-ups and then I got a quote from a des from a web development agency that was going to build it for me and I'm like 17 at the time I'm making like a couple grand a month like running this freelance marketing business and they quoted me like $25,000 oh, to build this software and I'm like that's the most amount of money I've ever heard in a <laughs> sentence before I'm like I don't have $25,000 like I, I barely have $2,500 <laughs> so I'm like well that that's that like let me just you know, keep doing mm -hmm. these marketing services. And so I kind of just shelved the idea. I always knew that it was a good idea. I always thought like maybe one day I'll build it. But uh, again, like the, the market timing wasn't right and I didn't have the, the resources or the know-how at the time to do it. And back then, you know, for everybody listening, I didn't know about no code. I didn't know, uh, you know, about like building an MVP and, mm -hmm. and doing something kind of like really like low or no code and then, you know, building something bigger later. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand these concepts. I, did, I knew nothing about software. I didn't even understand the concept of fundraising that I could mm -hmm. go out and get other people yeah. to give me money to, to build this thing. So kind of just continued on with life. I built, I built that marketing agency into a seven figure company and I did really well with it. And that's actually how I made like my first kind of like real money, which I then used to start media kits, you know, four years later. You hear that story a lot, the agency cash flows, and then you dump that into like a higher leverage opportunity. Absolutely. But you actually ended up raising money for media kits. Yeah. So that's really interesting. First off, how did you have one more backtrack? How did you have the self-awareness not to start it? Or to wait. So I'd love to sit here and tell you that I'm super self-aware and that it was like, <laughs> yeah. smart. but dude, honestly, it was the fact that if I had 25 grand, you when I, I probably would have done it yeah. and I probably would have ended up broke with mm. nothing to show for it because looking back at that development agency probably would not have been able, we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars building media kits. So knowing what it takes now, uh, like 25 grand, no way we would have had anything that mm -hmm. actually worked. It's safe. I would 100% say with confidence that software is the best business, like the best business model. Absolutely. As far as like just objectively high leverage recurring revenue and your ability to exit. Yep. And so many people don't think that it's like beginner friendly. So now that you've gone through it, because you kind of said you didn't start it at the beginning because 
you weren't It's capable. too hard. There's high, yeah. too high of a barrier to entry in yeah. my mind. But do you think that's true now? No. Do you think software, people should, like, if you're going to start a business, objectively, you want to start the best business. Yeah. And so if software is the best business, is there anything holding back a beginner from just jumping straight into software? It's never been a better time to start a software business. There are so many resources out there. There's so many ways to to build a software business, both conceptually and tactically, mm -hmm. um, that, that have just kind of leveled the playing field. Like, it's really a game of di distribution and marketing now at this point. Did you study, like, Y Combinator on YouTube, or how did you end up getting those skills? You know, you know what? Not, not really. Like, I didn't even know about, like, the whole VC world mm -hmm. until we started raising for media kits. Okay. Like, I didn't even know that it existed, quite frankly. Like, I was... Like I was in this world with with like Iman and these guys, like in like the digital marketing yeah. space. Like that was my world from mm -hmm. 2016 to 2019. Mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about like Silicon Valley. Like mm -hmm. the, of course, like I knew that it existed, but I didn't know any of the intricacies mm -hmm. about like how to fundraise and how to you know take an MVP to market or like join Y Combinator or any of these things. I didn't know they existed until I started raising for media kits. So you did raise money for media kits. Yeah. What was that experience like? I don't want to really go into like how to do it necessarily sure. because we'll talk about that later. Yeah. But in general, obviously it worked out because yeah. you sold the company. But I've always been like, I feel like that adds another level of pressure to you. Yeah. So is that, if you had the choice again, would you do it again? It's a complicated question um, for a couple of reasons. But what I will say, I want to preface this by saying that we bootstrapped media kits first. Okay. So by like by 2019, when we were kind of thinking about starting it, I'd saved up like a couple hundred grand and that was from my marketing agency and I started spending it on, on media kits. So I was paying for everything out of pocket. So we hired uh, two engineers and a software designer and I was spending like 15 to $18,000 a month of my own money when I only had, a, I only had a couple hundred that grand hurts. in the bank and I was spending like almost 20 grand a month just to build the software. I almost ran out of money. What like were I was, the cost mainly, just developers? Uh, two developers and a designer. Yeah, designer. Like they were a all UI, UX yep, designer. They were all about like five, six thousand bucks a month each, and then you have server costs and you have all these other things on top of it. And yeah, I just started to run out of money, and so out of desperation, I started to learn how to fundraise. And mm. so I guess to answer your question, if I had like millions and millions of dollars back, you know, in 2019, probably wouldn't have fundraised. But I'm glad that we did. Looking back, the only reason that we had the success that we did with it was because our investors opened so many doors to us. Mm. Uh, you know, we had Wiz Khalifa, we had the guys from Fuck Jerry, we had, mm -hmm. you know, so many influential people in the space that just opened doors to us, whether that was to our B2B uh, customers, talent agencies, getting some of the biggest influencers in, in, in the space on board, getting some of the biggest music labels. You know, we, we signed contracts with a couple of the, I can't talk about it, but a couple of the biggest music labels in, in the world because of the people that we had on our cap table, the people that we had as investors. So as I'm hearing you say this, I'm like, damn, this guy's like connected out the ass. He's got it all. It's like, no wonder he's successful. But I really like want to focus on like the time when you were bootstrapping. Sure. Like yeah. the amount of time you had to spend waiting, I'm sure. Because you're not a, are you technical yourself? No. So no. you can't code? Nope. Did your partner code at all? Nope. It was, okay, yeah, so Casey couldn't either. Both of you are non-technical. So you had to hire the technical team. Yep. I only have one quick interruption for the podcast today, guys. We're in the future. And right now you can actually build software with no code on a platform called Bubble. Not only that, you can actually plug AI into Bubble to build any AI software tool you want very quickly. We actually figured out how to build a AI tool to help students with their homework in just a few weeks. And we actually made a free course showing exactly how we did everything from plugging in the AI, building the actual app itself, and then even connecting Stripe to accept payments. And again, that's a completely free course that you can find in the link in the description below. Other than that, guys, enjoy the podcast. Share it with your friend if you're learning something. This has been a really good one so far, and it only gets better. You're spending 15 to 20K a month to get it built by these developers, yep. but really you're just kind of telling them the general idea and then you have to wait like a week or two for them to build it. Yeah. It's like, first off, that's stressful as shit. <laughs> Super <laughs> stressful. Your and when, when you're making yeah. no money too. And you don't even know if the idea yeah. is really validated. So yeah. did you have any form of validating the idea and what were you doing in the meantime while the developers were just working? Yeah, great question. So you're trying to start a software company. This is something that we did at Media Kits we did this kind of well, um, but my, my next two software companies after that, we did, I, we've like obsessed over this. And that is um, basically going out to your, to your target audience and surveying them and mm. getting feedback on, on a concept or an MVP. So MVP stands for minimum viable product. That's like, that should be like your North star. If you're thinking mm -hmm. about starting a software company, 
define what your MVP is going to be. So what is the least features, the, 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 basically the most stripped down version of the perfect product that you have in your head that you can build for the cheapest amount of money in the quickest amount of time, get it to market, stress test it, see if people would pay for it. So like one core function that is like the main exactly. value driver. Of and it your doesn't even have to be software. Yeah. It can be a clickable yeah. prototype. It can be a, it can mm. be a Wix website that has a couple hyperlinks on it. Mm-hmm. Like literally our first media kit that was like our, you know, our MVP was literally just a, a Figma prototype. Like we mm. put a couple screens in Figma and you can like link things in Figma to make it in a prototype to make it look like it's a real app. Mm. And we just had a clickable prototype and we would send this to influencers. Be like, hey, if this existed, would you use it? Yes, great. How much would you pay for it? So you would send them like a landing page explaining yeah. what it is yeah. and then just say, hey, is this something that you would use if it actually worked right now? Exactly. But they couldn't get any output. Yep, exactly. So, so you, but you're verbally asking them? We're, we're, you know, we were in DMs. We were DMing people, cold DMing people. We were reaching out to friends who were influencers and having them message their influencer friends and just mm. like network effect. We put out a type form that I think got like three or 400 responses. Okay, cool. Um, so even like down to our price point, like we charge 29 bucks a month for media kits our price point was determined by surveys that we sent out to our users. So sorry, keep going. No, I was just going to say we're, we're, we were very data focused. Mm. And again, in retrospect, we didn't even do it to the extent that I would have wanted to. Like it was kind of an afterthought. It was like, Holy shit, I'm spending 20 grand a month. Let me, let me make sure people Mm. would use this. So it was a few months into that, that I was like, let me just go ask people if they would actually use this. So we did it retroactively, but you know, I think anybody out there who's thinking about starting a software company, if you can come up with an MVP, it could be no code. It could be just a clickable prototype. You don't have to know how to code. The, the barrier to entry really is that low. For it's so exciting. Creating an MVP. Get out there. Talk to your customers. Everyone says that, but until you're like in that moment, it's kind of hard to like consider it. So what, what, did, like, what did the survey say and how did you incentivize people to fill it out? Yeah. So it would be... Um, So to incentivize them to fill it out, they would basically, we'd promise them that they would get like early access Mm. and that they would get like a discount on it when it, when it eventually came out. So that was, that was pretty easy. And like, there's plenty of ways to incentivize people to do things. Right. Um, so yeah, but the, the main thing is it was like a logic based survey. So we used a type form. So it was like, if somebody clicked something on the, on page one, it would take them to a different page than Mm. if they clicked something else. Right. It was like, yeah. So there's a bunch of logic built into it. So it was like, would you use this? If yes, then, well, why would you use it? Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, I'd use it for this reason. There's like a drop down with like four different things. And it's like, okay. And then, you know, use it for that reason. Like, well, how often would you use it? And how much would you pay for it? And this, this, and that. And it's like, well, if you wouldn't use this, why? Okay, for that, that reason. Okay, well, what would make you want to use it, mm-hmm. right? So we just collected as much information from our target users as we could. And that kind of helped us inform product decisions down the line. Okay, so that's another interesting point. You said down the line. Yeah. I'm like non-technical, but we're building software right now. And I have like a million different feature ideas that I want done, but I'm getting so ahead of myself because like we're just now getting the MVP done. Yeah. Every idea I have could add two, three, four weeks of an expensive developer. Absolutely. So what, like, first off, how did you choose what's implement and whatnot? Obviously, it's probably just like a risk reward. Yeah. But like, tell me more about what you were doing in that meantime while you were waiting. So there's there's this concept called, called a control point. So it's like, you want to create something that becomes like the control point for the rest of your products. So what is like that core product? Like for us, it was the media kit Mm -hmm. at at media kits, right? And then we can expand from there. Okay. Okay. So if we can build the best, simplest, easiest to use media kit product out there, then eventually we can go build a marketplace Mm -hmm. or we can build a B2B offering for talent agencies. We can do this, this and that. Right. And even so, uh, to give further context on that, our MVP was just, uh, Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. We didn't even have TikTok or YouTube when we launched. Mm. So that's another example of how you can do an MVP. Like limit integrations, Mm -hmm. limit the amount of UI that you're building, limit the amount of functionality. And so the idea, the goal of your user interviews when you're early, when you're you're building your MVP should be to find out what is the one thing that would make them use it? Mm. What is the one thing that's non-negotiable, right? Mm. And then from there, you can build the rest of the features, but you got to get their attention. You got to get them in first. And so what is that thing that's going to get them in? And what you'll find, this goes for anybody building any kind of software, whether it's a no code, like bubble software or something really complex, doesn't matter what it is. What you're going to find is your early adopters, your early users are 
are going to use just a couple core functionalities and they don't care about everything else. Mm. All the cool feature ideas you have in your head, there are definitely people out there that would use that mm. and that, are, that would also think it's cool. But in the beginning, there are plenty of users out there that would use and pay for just the very, very simple version of you know just your core functionality. And so that's kind of what the goal of the survey is, is yeah. to see what most people are trying to use it for. Exactly. And you might find out, I'm sure you didn't, but I'm, you might find out that like almost everybody's using it for a complete different reason than why yep. you make it. So you might have an idea to pivot, but exactly. was it pretty consistent? It was pretty consistent. I think we did a good job at collecting the feedback and understanding what people were, were saying. Uh, you know, the old saying is like, if you try to please everyone, you'll please no one. Yeah. That goes for all areas of life, but yeah. especially in software. Definitely. Like if you, it, it's called feature brain. If you're too feature brain mm -hmm. and you're thinking, and this is, this is both on the product and the sales side. If your product is too feature heavy and not, not outcome or solution heavy, mm. then it's not going to work. And on, uh, conversely, on the sales side, if you're selling software, even for anybody listening, if you're maybe working for a software company and you're selling software for a living, if you're just selling the features all day, like no, no one buys features. Mm. People buy outcomes. Mm. People buy solutions to problems. I like right? that a lot. And so if you can think about that from a product perspective and build software that solves problems, then the features will come. Because all people are thinking about is how, is it, how does it benefit me directly? Absolutely. And they're not thinking about the technical API connection. They just want to know how I can use this to make my life better. Yeah. And or there's so many rabbit holes we can go down here. But like what I'll say is like if you go to mediakits.com and like you look at our old, like our website, I don't, obviously I don't own the company anymore, but it's still there. You can go to our website, all the copy on the website. It's not, um, it's not, uh, you know, come and, you know, show all your analytics. It's like, get more brand deals, mm. right? It's like the end result. Exactly. It's the mm. outcome. Like mm. make yourself look more professional, mm -hmm. right? Impress brands. Like this is the type of copy that we used on our, on our website because that's what the product does. Mm. The product gets you to an outcome, gets you to finding a solution for this really annoying problem that you've been having. And a lot of, a lot of software companies and quite frankly, any kind of company, like if you don't know what your customers are looking for in terms right. of outcomes and and solutions to their problems mm -hmm. then you're never going to build a good product it's like that's such a good point it's like why does this exist because you could say two different things in your landing page get all of your social media statistics in one place yeah that could be your landing page copy or get more brand deals yep exact same product but that one actually resonates with people much more strongly exactly and that's why they sign up it, that's really cool outcome based outcome based selling outcome based copy mm, that's a great one okay thank you for that that taught yeah. me a really clear insight now okay cool so is there anything else during that, like to optimize your time in that building phase when you're just sinking the money in that you decided to do that was like <laughs> helpful in any way uh, that you can think of? Freak out, worry yeah, about it. That's, I, um, I totally get that. Um, you know, honestly, man, that, that part of my life was like a blur. Like mm -hmm. it was just so. Are you still doing agency work on the side? Yeah. Like, oh, for sure. To, like, keep yeah. It alive? I was just like barely, like I was just trying to break even every month. Like <laughs> yeah. I was like, if I can make like, yeah, yeah. like, cause my agency at the time I was doing like maybe 50, 60 grand a month in, mm -hmm. in top line mm -hmm. revenue. So I was taking home like 20 or 30 and I was spending all of it on software and, rent, and then every, all, everything personal car, for me. Yeah. Like, yeah that's all net negative mm -hmm. at that mm -hmm. point. So I'm like freaking out. And, um, we were trying to figure out like how, like, how do we get this to market? Like, mm -hmm. you, you know, just like, how do we put this out there so that people can start using it and, and hopefully pay for it? And when it became obvious that we were too far away from that, I was just kind of doing the math. I'm like, all right, I've got this much like dry powder left. Dry, dry powder is another word for like money in the bank. Mm -hmm. Like I've got this much money left and I'm spending this much and we need this many more months before the product is in a place where we can sell it, which by the way, in retrospect, totally flawed thinking. I could oh, have, okay. I could have shipped the product way earlier than we yeah. did and started generating revenue. And that's one of the biggest mistakes looking back. Were you we, focused too much on like the design, how it looked? Yeah, totally. Yeah. We, and that's every first time founder, yeah. every first time software company b makes that mistake. They think the product needs to be perfect before they launch it. So yeah, in retrospect, should have launched way sooner, but hindsight's 2020. Yeah. At the time, I'm like, we don't have enough money to get this to a place where it's sellable. And so that's ultimately why we decided to go out and try to fundraise. And that's what I did with a lot of my free time is. Okay. Is so that. I have been, I think this is a good time to go into it. So sure. first off, why did you even decide to fundraise and go through with it instead of just saying, I wasn't over my head. I'm just going to stick with my agency. I'm making 20 K a month. Yeah. I'm killing it. I'm only what? 21. At the I was time? 20, 20. Yeah. Like I'm killing it, making 20 K a month. Yeah. What made you like take that challenge head on? I wanted change. So like, like you kind of mentioned, 
I knew that there was a, that there was a glass ceiling on agency work. Mm -hmm. It was, it was basically just my face. Like I had like a one-to-one relationship with all my clients. I had a team, but like it was me. Like I was basically Mm -hmm. a freelancer with a team Mm -hmm. at that point. And I wanted more. I wanted to, I I didn't want to just be like a Facebook ads monkey anymore. Like I was literally like (laughs) every, every day I was just in Facebook ads, just like tweaking campaigns. And I'm just like, I wasn't finding fulfillment with that. And I'd like, I'd put away a decent amount of money. I'd made a lot, a lot of great friends in the industry and I just wanted to do something different. And I always knew that I wanted to do something in software mm-hmm. because to the point we made early in this podcast, it's like, that's where the highest leverage is. Yeah. You can sell the same thing over and over and over again. You get 10, 15 X multiples on you know the value of your company. And so it just made sense to me logically. I'm like, if I can just stack up enough money to start a software company, I think that's where I'll make mm-hmm. the real money. And so that's kind of how I was thinking about it. And then, you know, my, my business partner, Casey Adams, he had a podcast Mm -hmm. uh, where he interviewed like a couple dozen billionaires, a bunch of, yeah, Yeah. a bunch of really successful people, a bunch of venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. And so we're just kind of sitting one day. And at this point, you know, we had become co-founders of media kits and we're just, again, self-funding it. Mm -hmm. He comes to me one day, he's like, Hey, Kieran, like, what if we ask some of my podcast guests to like invest in media kits? And that literally, it broke my brain. Mm -hmm. It was like a, it was like a whole new frame, a whole new way of thinking. And I'm like, wait a minute. Like you're telling me that there's like wealthy people that would give us their money to build this. Mm. I'm like, of course I know that that exists. Like I know that venture capital is a thing, but I just couldn't wrap my head around why someone would want to give us their money to to build this thing. (laughs) It was just, it was just like a foreign concept to me. And so sure enough, like a couple weeks later, we put a little pitch deck together and we went out and we started talking to some, some of these people that Casey had on his podcast over the years. And we start, we got a $25,000 check mm. and then we got a $50,000 check and then we got a hundred thousand and then a hundred fifty thousand dollars check. And th- these investors, like these wealthy people are friends with guess what? Other wealthy people. And they would tell their friends that they just invested in media kits. Mm-hmm. And then they'd be like, well, I want to invest in media kits too. And then they would write a check to us. And before you know it, we had a, a million and a half dollars in our, in our checking account for this mm. business. Oh my God, that, I didn't know you raised that much. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Is there like a, first off, is there like a standard for how much equity you give away per round? Because it's like your angel round, right? Your yeah. seed round? What is it? Yeah. Angel? So, uh, it, it was like a, it was a seed round. A yeah. seed round. Typically you want to give away like 10 to 20%, but there's so much nuance to it. I mean, yeah. it depends on... I mean, the type of business. You're just making it up at that point, though, right? Oh, like, you're totally you're pulling 10%, it out. You're saying 10%. I'm yeah. going to guess my company could potentially be worth $10 million. So, Well, it's it's just like anything else. It's whatever people are willing to pay. Yeah. Right? And so it's like, um, I don't. I can talk about this number. We raised our first round at a, at a $5 million valuation. Okay. And that's like a relatively standard seed round. Mm-hmm. Um, like even like a lot of YC companies, they'll raise their first round of funding at a $5 million valuation. Did you have any customers? No. At that point? No customers, no revenue. Available? No. Me? It oh was, it was mock-ups and, click, cool. and clickable prototypes. Wow. Yeah. And so, yeah, I mean, ultimately like the fundraising process, again, it, it's a game of, of describing your vision and helping other people see your vision. And it's also a game of FOMO. Like when a bunch mm-hmm. of really notable investors put money mm-hmm. into something, you know, just like any other market, oh, yeah. whether it's stocks or crypto or whatever else, it's like other people want in. Right. Right. And so it's, it's the same thing, but you just, you have to manufacture it on like mm-hmm. a grassroots level, 100%. which is the hardest part. But, um, yeah, I had no clue what I was doing. And just to be clear, I don't want to make it sound like this was super easy or anything. We fundraised that, that million and a half dollars took us over nine months to raise from start to finish. How many people did you talk to? Oh, great. <laughs> I have those numbers. I actually have the old like fundraise CRM from media kits mm-hmm. still on my computer because it's like motivation for me. We talked to over 350 people and we raised money from 30. And those are all like one-on-one calls pretty one-on-one much? One-on-one calls. Usually 30 minutes to 45 so you minutes. Had, you talked to 350 people and only 30 people, only is a lot, but that's so many calls. I can't like, I, that's so much time. Yeah. So th- I mean the typical rule I always tell whenever a founder asks me for fundraising advice, I'm like, Holy shit. talk to about 10 times as many people as you think you need to talk to. How do you even find that many? Just friends, like referral, referral, referral? Yeah, fr- friends of other investors. That's, that's the biggest one. Uh, Twitter is amazing for, uh, for finding investors. There, really? There's a whole, dude, th- yeah, there's a whole VC community on Twitter. A lot of like early stage mm. venture funds will even have like public links where you can apply ah. and send your pitch deck in. I guess their job is literally to yeah. give money. So that's <laughs> like, one of the biggest- They're looking for l- people. Let me, let me talk about that for a second. That's one of the biggest paradigm shifts. Mm-hmm. For anybody listening that's thinking about raising money 
whether it's for a software company or a consumer package goods company or you know even like a real estate project whatever it is if you're thinking about raising money from investors you got to understand how investors think mm. investors are literally capital allocators for a living mm -hmm. their job is to put money somewhere and it might as well be with you because you're building the next big thing and the other paradigm shift that i had and this has been so helpful um, you know, for fundraising, even like for my new venture is if you are 100% certain that whatever you're building is going to be successful, which of course, statistically, not everything's going to be successful, but if you're not a hundred percent sure and a hundred percent confident in yourself, then you probably shouldn't be starting a business anyway. Yeah. But if you are absolutely certain that you have an idea that's going to change the world or that's going to change an industry, or that's just simply going to make money and be mm -hmm. successful, it doesn't even have to change the world. If you're so confident that it's going to do that, then it should, it's a privilege that somebody is allowed to invest in my company. It definitely, right? You definitely flip that, like the top That's 1 the paradigm of founders. Shift. A lot of founders hmm. feel, like, feel like they are like begging for money from investors. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you feel that way or that you position it that way or you give off that energy, yeah, you're, 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 you're gonna lose. Mm -hmm. When you come into a call, it's like, all right, this investor, I might give them the opportunity to mm -hmm. invest in, in my company because my company is going to make them so much money and it's an opportunity that they, sh that they would be stupid to pass on. But up. you cannot say that. You can't them. say that. You just have to be <laughs> thinking that. Arrogant. Of but course. That's 100% true because you can only raise a million dollars or $2 million. That's just for simple math, 100,000 each. Yeah. They get 1% each. Only 10 investors can do that. And if you're right, that could turn into millions of dollars for them. Absolutely. And so then all these investors start FOMOing in. Like if exactly. my three friends here said, I invested in this company 50 grand, then he starts, my other friend invests $50,000. I want to be like, oh shit, I'm going to miss out. There's something here. And yeah. so you can definitely create that FOMO from investors. 100%. I never thought about it like that. Yeah. Hmm. No, it's, it's literally their job. And all you really have to do is like, you don't have to be qualified. You don't need a degree, a college degree to raise money. You no. literally just have to have you just have to convince a rich person to give you money. Is that yeah, <laughs> literally dude, it? for sure? And I want I want to bring this back down too for you know any of the any of the younger guys or the beginners that are listening to this. It's like you were twenty. I was yeah, but I, I want to say like it's not as intimidating as it might seem mm. once you start to understand the intricacies. And I will say um, there's a book out there that really helped me with fundraising. It's called Fundraising by okay. by Ryan Breslow. Uh, he's the founder of Bolt, like the one click checkout company. Mm -hmm. They're oh, like wow. a ten billion dollar company or something. Um, if anybody's thinking about fundraising, go buy that book on Amazon and read it. It's like the best book for, for founders to read about fundraising. But the next thing that I'll say is you don't have to know wealthy people to, to raise money from, uh, you know, fr from somebody, right? You can crowdfund. There's platforms out there like republic.com, for example, um, that, you know, where you can crowdfund invest mm -hmm. investment. Um, you know, again, you can go and you can just cold outreach to, to VCs on Twitter. Like there's so many ways, if you're scrappy, if you're a hustler, mm -hmm. If you truly believe in what you're building that you can go and find money there's n there is such abundance in this world and there's so much money out there that's looking for yeah. a home that's looking to be allocated somewhere and all you got to do is find it yeah because i mean people have tens of millions of dollars they want their money to do the work for them and if they can find some smart person with a good idea to yeah. do all the work and they just have to fund it absolutely it's a no brainer and even if they lose a few million dollars that one yeah. hits, they make their money back. So well, yeah, that's that's the thing. The like concept uh, makes sense. Again, a venture capitalist, if they invest, you know, if they, if they, if they have $10 million and they invest in 10 companies, a million dollars each, and, you know, five of them go to zero, it's like, yeah, they lost $5 million. But if one of those 10 becomes a billion dollar company, mm -hmm. then, you know, they, they just, you know, at 10 or 100x their money or whatever in terms of like dilution and everything else that might have happened in the meantime. But, you know, they made all of their, their losses back and then some. And so these investors are also playing a game too. Yeah. They're playing a numbers game. Yeah. And so again, you just have to believe in yourself and be confident enough to, to know that you're going to do whatever it takes to make this successful. Yeah. And if an investor can see that in you, if they know that you're going to do whatever it takes to make it successful, then they're going to invest in you every time. Okay. That's really good advice. I do want to take the conversation a little different way because I know a lot of people out there are going to be sure. like still yeah. like, even though we're saying that, yeah. still intimidated, scary. They just don't of want course. to do it yet. Yeah. So, but just to wrap this topic up, if you had $1.5 million liquid at that time, or moving into your future ventures, would you still choose to raise money knowing that you could, like there's a pressure that you're losing somebody else's money. Like me as a person, I would rather lose my own money than someone else's, even though that's probably not the best business choice. So if you had 1.5 million, would you do it yourself and bootstrap it or would you have investors? Neither, I would do a hybrid. Okay. So 
the reason that again a so risk tolerance balance basically not risk uh, opportunity okay so a, a big reason why people raise money from what we call strategic investors is because they can open doors that yep. you can't buy yourself mm. so i would raise way less maybe only like a couple hundred grand but mm. If an investor that has a crazy network or access to certain things inside of your industry that are very specialized and they can open doors to that, mm -hmm. they're much more inclined to so open doors to that if, yeah. they're, if they have skin that's in the game. That's why Wiz Khalifa makes sense. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. So Wiz Khalifa was one of his investors initially. And so you got the money. It was pretty much already built almost, kind of. Pretty much, yeah. And then that just kind of gave you the peace of mind and you could start planning so how much got devoted to like marketing and growth and how much got allocated towards building product? Yeah. So this is where we can really get into tactics. Uh, we spent $40,000 on marketing in the lifetime of the business. Wow. Yeah. On, on paid marketing. So that's the theory that if you make a good product that people want, they're going to share it and word of mouth will take it. Absolutely. So if you make a good product, you don't really need to market, even though you were a marketer. So you could have if you wanted oh, to. Oh, we still, we still marketed. I just said we didn't spend a ton of money you on it. Okay, uh, okay, we okay. absolutely marketed. Oh, okay. I'm ready we, to hear we, this. Yeah. Well, and that's like in terms of like really tactical stuff, yeah. like to get a consumer product to go viral. I mean, I don't think anybody does it better than, than Hunter Isaacson, good buddy of mine mm -hmm. who's behind NGL app. I'm going to have him on here soon. Y you got to. He's, yeah, genius, oh my God, bro. he he's going to, he's going to dunk on anything that I'm about to say in terms of, <laughs> in terms of product led growth, but he definitely does not <laughs> hold back his opinion. Oh man. He's, <laughs> I love it. He's great. I, I love Hunter. But yeah, I mean the big reason, like we got to 30,000 users in like under six months mm. because we went viral on TikTok. Mm-hmm. And so I know you had Oliver on who talked yeah. about the same thing. He's a, he has a CPG company, but this just goes to show like we had a software product. He has a, a, you know, a physical goods product. And both of us basically built our businesses on the back of TikTok organic virality. But I want to understand right? it because his makes sense to me because it's sure. sex chocolate. It's controversial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It catches your eye. Media kits? I'm not necessarily going to naturally send this to my girlfriend or send this in the group no. chat of the boys. I mean, yeah. And just apples to apples, like we probably didn't have nearly as many like views or impressions or anything like that Oliver does because he can sell to literally anybody. Anybody mm -hmm. with a credit card can buy his product yeah. versus like media kits. Have you you kind of have following. to be like a social media yeah. influencer to do it. So the key for us was we went kind of like niche viral mm. inside of a couple key communities. There so. We go. We went viral uh, first and foremost in like the TikTok influencer space. Mm. So there was uh, a TikToker named Josh Richards who was also uh, an yep. investor in our company. Oh, um, really? Yeah, and we basically, we literally posted a video. You can still find it on our, on our Media Kits TikTok if you scroll down enough. But it got like 1.5 million or, one, or like almost 2 million views uh, in like a week. And it was literally like, this is the media kit that Josh Richards uses to get brand deals mm. with like that robotic voice from TikTok. Like that mm. was literally all it was. And it got like two or 300,000 views overnight. Mm. And we went from, we, we launched, we had like 2,000 users. And it was just literally like our launch party in August was like a big spike. And then September, October, we're getting like five, six signups a day. Mm. And it was just dead for like two months. Mm -hmm. We were freaking out. Yeah. And then this video, I think we posted it in November. So you posted it? Uh, I think Casey posted it. Okay. Um, like, did you have like a company TikTok or was it? Yeah, we had a company TikTok. Okay. Yep. And it had that's like, what I meant. So had, media kits. Yeah. Account oh posted. yeah. Media, media kits okay, posted. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. My business partner made it. Uh, media kits account posted it, and it went viral in November. I think it was like the first week of November, and it just went through the roof. Mm -hmm. We went from getting like five six signups a day to like five hundred signups a day. So that so like, like borderline major company that one, like that like one TikTok. Like, uh -huh. That one TikTok, and then well, the, and the second wave of virality that we had that really that really helped was in the Twitch streamer community. Mm. So I don't know if, if I don't know if you know this. I didn't even know this until until this happened. But the Twitch streamer community is like massive, mm -hmm. and like they there's like this crazy crazy community of Twitch streamers, and they only oh, yeah. have like a few thousand followers each. But the influence they have because it's long form, mm -hmm. it's like a TikToker it's like with, their friend at that point exactly a tiktoker with 2 million followers in my opinion has less influence than a twitch streamer with 10,000 tiktokers have the least influence exactly you don't even like search for their content it, you, yeah. have to, like, you don't even know who they are you don't know their names you don't know what their Seven voice sounds of like your life yeah exactly so these twitch streamers have these cult followings yeah and they're also another thing about them is they're all friends with each other yeah and so we then after going viral on tiktok we went viral on twitter which is where all the twitch streamers hang yeah. out when they're not streaming mm -hmm. Um, and that sent us through the roof again. And we actually, um, we, we didn't even have a Twitch integration at the time, mm. but we had a couple of Twitch streamers that were using it for their other social platforms. Yeah, yeah. And then we built a Twitch integration 
And then they started talking about it and it just, boom, another viral hit. Mm. And it just went crazy on Twitter. That just makes so much sense because at that point you like want your friends to also succeed. And if this helps you make more money, you instantly tell your friends about it. Exactly. That's exactly. really important with any SaaS. And so now you're in a B2B SaaS. So that's absolutely the same but concept. B2B or B2C, there is something called product-led growth. So the, the terminal, it's PLG. Mm -hmm. If you ever hear PLG in the software space, it means product-led growth. And that means that the product does the marketing for you. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you don't have to put money into ads. You don't have to do any of this because the product will market itself for you. And one of the ways that we had PLG at Media Kits is when you signed up, you would get your link. And you're kind of inherently, you inherently you want to share your link yeah. because you want to get brand deals. Right. So guess what? People started putting it in their link trees. They mm. started tweeting about it. They started posting on Instagram. Mm. They started posting it on Twitter. They started pulling it up That's in really the middle big. of their Twitch That's streams. Really and so it's basically just free distribution, free marketing for us as a company. And that was how we hit product led growth. And, and specifically in the Twitch streamer community, like we had these Twitch streamers that would sign up for the product and then immediately post their link on Twitter. And then their friends would see that and they would sign yeah. up and post their link. And it was just this viral like network effect. Cause they don't have to like tweet it and say, Hey, check out my media kit, but it's there. And then yeah. other people that are like kind of looking at what are they doing? What can I add to my game? Yeah. They see that and like look into it and then they make their own account. Exactly. So it has yeah. like an organic exactly. ability. That's really smart. So I was going to ask you, that's like what, that TikTok is what made it go big, like yeah. kind of like your moment. But you did have an interesting strategy with your launch party and yeah. you launched on Product Hunt. So can you explain yeah. this to you real quick? Yeah, so Product Hunt, for those that don't know, is basically a platform that allows people to like crowd vote um, on certain product ideas. Mm -hmm. So it, literally anything, like there's, there's B2B stuff on there. It's mainly like B2C stuff, but there, there's some B2B products on there and it's everything from like little tiny like micro SaaS apps mm -hmm. all the way up to like proper companies, like companies that, you, that are like household names that you and I would know have been launched on mm -hmm. Product Hunt. Um, and so yeah, basically like you go on there and you just vote on your favorite products. And we posted media kits on there the day after we launched and uh, we got second highest voted product of the day, Amazing. which is annoying. I wish we got first. We, we, uh, Two's good. Yeah, you know, it is what it is. But <laughs> yeah, there, the product before us was, was super sick, so can't complain. But, um, but yeah, it's great exposure. Um, product Hunt combined with our launch party got us our first couple thousand users. And um, yeah, Product Hunt's great. If you're thinking about launching a SaaS platform, like launching on Product Hunt is a great way to get some initial exposure from you know, mainly like the software and the development community. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, our, our launch party was kind of, um, it, was, it was very intentional. Mm -hmm. So Casey and I, before doing media kits, we actually used to throw networking events in LA. We would mm -hmm. like rent these crazy houses. That's, and that's, then- I think that's how our network got connected. Exactly, sure, yeah. yeah, exactly. So all of, a lot of our mutual friends, mm -hmm. like that's how I met them. Is yeah. I'd throw these parties in LA with Casey. We'd sell tickets for like 50 bucks a piece. We'd rent a house for a day up mm -hmm. in like the Hollywood Hills for like, six or seven thousand dollars which back then was like all the a money casey and yeah. i had like we we're i'm talking like 17 18 years old we'd spend like all of our money on like renting this crazy house and then we'd sell tickets for like 50 or 100 bucks a pop and then we'd have speakers and then we'd have like a little party at the end we'd have catering and whatever we did this like four or five times was it profitable um no it never made money but it, it just in fact it doors. lost money most of the time but, but open doors yeah open doors Exactly. And, you know, even a few people that we met at those parties, like ended up investing in media kits. So mm. it just goes to show that everything comes full circle. But yeah, basically like Casey and I had thrown these parties and we knew that it was just a great way to, to bring people together. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to throw one for media kits. And basically we just like got this event space, which is, uh, was owned by one of our investors again. There so there's another reason like why you want to bring in smart money, um, and strategic investors. But yeah, we got this event space. Um, Wiz Khalifa gave us like a massive discount on his appearance fee again nice. because he was involved in media kits mm. and so yeah we had Wiz Khalifa come and perform and it was just like a great networking event and we threw it in LA too so of course um, some of the biggest influencers in the world were there which also meant that pretty much everything at the event we got for free so all the drinks all the catering like all the stuff that was there for people all the products and, and uh, beverages were all sponsored because all these beverage companies wanted their beverages to be in the hands yeah. of these big influencers yeah. that they knew were going to be at our party. Video, yeah. We kind of like game the system in that way. And, uh, and then, yeah, it was a hit. We got a couple thousand signups off of it. Wiz Khalifa got to meet him in person. That was sick. That's dope. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, 
from there, we hadn't really figured out product-led growth yet. So mm-hmm. after the launch party, the initial hype, a couple thousand signups, it just flatlined for about two months until that TikTok video went viral. Did you ever struggle with churn after that event? Um, not really. Um, we didn't even have our paid subscription out back oh, okay. then. It was just free only. Gotcha. Um, so, so no. We did have a we did have some struggles with like product adoption. So people would sign up, they'd make an account and they wouldn't actually build a media kit. Cause there's like two steps to using our platform. So it was free for that part? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It was always free. It was a freemium product. So it was free to make a media kit. And then if you wanted like the bells and whistles and like the upgraded stuff, then you could pay for it. What were some of the key upgrades? White labeling it. So like removing our logo, okay. um, customizing it, adding more than, I think more than three platforms, I think is where we limited it at. So if you wanted, if you had Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and you wanted to add Twitch or YouTube or something, you'd have to pay for the upgraded program. Um, there was uh, like, like pro analytics. We had additional analytics that we, that we uh, kept behind a paywall. There was creating more than one media kit actually was a big one for us. So mm. like, you know, you might have one media kit that's specific to your Twitter and yeah. one that's specific to your YouTube. Gotcha. Um, and so that was another big one. So on, on our free plan, you could only have one media kit. Gotcha. So there's, there's a bunch of stuff that we put behind a paywall. Could you, do you know the ratio between people who just use the freemium or can you not share that? Can you share that? Um, I mean, I'm sure people could like reverse engineer the numbers if I share that. So probably not, but okay. yeah, it, it was a pretty decent conversion rate. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. The multiple media kit tied like yeah, yeah, yeah. the YouTube. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense. Okay, cool. So by the way, the product launch was basically since you, you lived in LA, right? Yeah. He lived in LA influencers are your target demographic. So just throw a party of influencers, put exactly. media kits everywhere, say media kits launch party, and you have this core base that's gonna look into it. And then you basically started, you didn't have the product led growth, but after that you learned you needed that. We figured it out, yeah. And so the freemium version, people could just use it. If they wanted to put it into like their link tree in their bio, people would initially find it. Yeah, so, exactly. So let me recap. You had the idea in 2017, but it was too early. You didn't have the knowledge or the resources. Then later around COVID, you see this probably before COVID, right? Right, right after COVID had okay, hit. Right yeah. around there. You see yeah. a resurgence in TikTok influencers yep. coming huge. And so you're like, hey, that idea is something I want to pursue. You hired two developers and a designer. You spend way too long designing it before launching it to have to figure out how to raise money. You do it with your network. And then from there, you're able to get it done. Don't do a ton of marketing. You launch on Product Hunt. Uh, you do the launch party, get to enough users, but then you find out the product-led growth problem and you come up with that idea, and then your strategic investor, Josh Richards, makes a TikTok that goes viral, and that skyrockets the growth of the software. Absolutely. Is that a good way yep. to recap? And, and that, yeah, and then six months later, we got acquired. Six months later, you got acquired. And you chose to sell basically because you were pretty much out of that runway, and so you had to either raise another round. You had a lot of users, so you're making decent yeah. revenue. And so, but you still need to raise revenue to, or raise money to continue that level of growth, I assume. Yeah, exactly. We actually, um, we literally had the acquisition offer and an offer to raise another round of funding at a pretty, at like a yeah. an, at like an eight figure valuation, um, both on our desk. It really just comes down to how far did you want to take it? Yeah. And then ultimately who was, has, who was in a position to actually make this successful? Yeah. And you basically looked at the market and you saw a lot of competitors I'm, again, he made Com- a whole video on this. Go watch his channel. Yeah, but <laughs> Com- competitors that were like small companies, like our size, and then we also had Meta rolling out a media kit tool and YouTube rolling out a media kit tool. It's like, and I can't help yeah. but think that maybe we influenced them a little. Definitely. Bit. I mean, it's like, it's like it's like Amazon. You know, like Amazon has all the data, and so like they have yeah. Amazon Basics, and yeah. so they'll just like see which products are selling at a really high margin right now. Yeah. All right, let's just figure out how to make that real quick. And yeah, then it's it's the same in software, and like we can talk about this too, like. In software, um, so- software in and of itself is not IP anymore. Like it used to be because it was so hard to build. But the-, the barrier to entry is so low now that like anybody out there listening, if you build a great product and you start making a bunch of money, someone is going to rip you off. Mm-hmm. It's not if, it's when. Exactly. And so the way that you build defensibility and IP in software is brand and distribution. And so with media kits, we had brand nailed down pretty early like things like our domain and the the people we had involved and stuff like that's brand right and then distribution would be things like product-led growth or channel partners or you know investors that are walking us into the you know the biggest uh, music labels in in the Mm -hmm. country to get us you know enterprise deals like that is how you build a moat and how you build ip and defensibility around a software product the code itself is never going to be defensible. Yep. There's always someone out there that's going to be able to take what you're doing and re-engineer it. It's like your advantages that other people can't replicate. Exactly. Even though they're not like, you don't create them. It's just your relationships or something that you, other people have built up for you. And you yep. can combine forces. Yep. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. But this kind of actually is a great segue into micro SaaS. Because yeah. that was something that 
most Facebook and YouTube have a broad product. They yeah. were neglecting that. But over time, they're getting a lot of things done. They're ready to tackle that because now they're yeah. seeing that it's a market because they can clearly see how successful yeah. it is in all these link trees. Your competitors see that too. And so you saw a lot of people kind of starting it. You saw that you weren't, you were self-aware to know that you probably couldn't compete with Meta and a company that wanted to buy it was like actually had a lot of those advantages. Exactly. And so you wanted to hand it off to them because you think they could do it well. Did you have to work there at all? I did, yeah. I worked there for a few months. So did Casey. Um, and then I left because I want to start something new. But you were allowed to leave? Um, like, was there like contingencies? Yeah, there was an earnout. Um, okay. I left before it was like fully vested. Um, but mm. it is what it is. It's at that point, it was an opportunity cost thing for me. Exactly. It's like, exactly. you know, I made a little bit of money on the acquisition and then I could have made more by staying, but I chose to, I chose to bet on myself and start something new mm -hmm. as opposed to waiting there. Okay, so, so then let's just go straight into what, you, right when you left, yeah. I would do the same thing. I don't think I could work for something yeah. like that. I get it. Um, but next you went into what we're going to call the micro SaaS phase of your life. Yeah. Did you sell everything, move to Bali, then just make that real yeah. quick? <laughs> no, so, so the crazy thing about that, I don't even know if I went into this in the video, but yeah, basically the software company that I eventually sold to Iman, um, we built it. So, so keep in mind, I had my marketing agency started media kits, the marketing agency kept running. And mm -hmm. it was actually, we never took a salary from media kits. Like Casey and I never paid ourselves. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons I was able to do that is because I had this marketing agency yeah. that was still making money. Of course. And so I had a business partner at the marketing agency, Caden, um, who was running it when I was running media kits. So he was just keeping, you know, just basically maintaining it, yeah. keeping, keeping the clients happy. And uh, we used this white labeled CRM. Okay. And this white labeled CRM had a problem on a per client basis, we could see everything like ad spend, click through rate, like all these things that you need to know as a marketing agency, like all your analytics, but you could only see it per client. And so you'd have to click into every account, go to the analytics, ironically, very similar to the problem with media kits is like the analytics are there. They're just dispersed in a way that like isn't easy to access. Mm -hmm. And so I always joke that um, this company, agencyreporting.com, was like, it's like media kits for marketing agencies. It's like kind of the same concept. It's just taking analytics from an API that already exists and just centralizing them in a, in a nice UI. Mm -hmm. Like that's basically what it was. But anyway, we had this problem where like we had, we had over 100 clients at one point and we just couldn't keep track of all the different metrics. And like we'd, we'd jump on a client call and it'd be like, oh, well, like, how are the leads doing this week or where's the ad spend in relation to the monthly budget or where is the click through rate where you know versus last month and mm -hmm. like these are just basic answers that are basic questions that we couldn't answer as easily as if we had it all in one dashboard so what we did uh, in the spirit of building an mvp mm -hmm. uh, we went and just um, basically pulled the api into a google sheets originally nice but it was a disaster. Mm -hmm. Like my, my business partner, Caden's like a wizard on, on Excel and Google Sheets. And so he did it and it worked, but it was just, it was slow and it was like, things would break all the time. Like, you know, the logic mm -hmm. that connects everything would like break and like things would like error out. Like, man, like, what if we just built our own software to do this? And so I found the domain agencyreporting.com, bought it for way less than you might think I bought it for. Um, and basically we went and we took all of the data from this white labeled CRM across all the, all of our clients. And we basically built a dashboard the way that we wanted to see that data. And we built it for ourselves. And we, ne we never even thought that we would sell this to anyone else. We just built it for our own agency. Mm -hmm. And we used our own profit from our agency to pay for it. And, uh, and then once it was built, we shared it with a couple buddies that were using the same white labeled software. And they were like, yo, can, like, can I use that? I'm like, Sure. Yeah. Huh. How, what, how difficult was it to transition from internal use to productized? I mean, in terms of like, you it wasn't know, productized, we, I guess. Was yeah. It? It, kind of like we, we built it in a way that it was scalable. Um, we just didn't have like a way to take payment. Oh, okay. So it was basically, yeah, I was just creating a new user account or like, okay, yeah, let's just, just put duplicate. like a, let's put a Stripe yeah. paywall on this thing and see if people will buy it. Just connect um, their account. Interesting. So uh, yeah, I mean, basically what we did is like this, this white labeled, uh, CRM company has like Facebook groups with like tens of thousands of people in them that are all like agency owners like we were. And uh, w I went in there and again, just like media kits, I was like, Hey guys, like if something like this existed, like, would you use it? And then I went and everybody that said, yes, I just PM them on Facebook. I'd be like, Hey, check this out. And I'd send them the link and they'd go sign up. And they, mm. uh, originally it was a wait list. And then eventually we started taking, taking payment. Um, yeah, we had like 400 agency owners that signed up for the wait list. Oh my God. Um, in like a day. Holy shit. And so we're like, wow, well, this is a very clear product market pit fit. Um, that's another term in software that's used very often, PMF, mm -hmm. product market fit. It means that your product actually resonates with your target yeah. market. Um, and you yeah. validate that they want it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. 
so yeah, that's, that's how we, uh, that's how we got our first customers for that. And, um, yeah, we're like, okay, cool. Well, we're, we're selling this now. We got it up to a decent like MRR run rate. Mm -hmm. Um, but it wasn't something that like we wanted to do long-term and when we launched, it was right around the time that I sold media kits. Like mm. we were kind of like working on this just like in our free time. Yeah. And, um, it was like making decent money. And I was like, I have, I want to build something else. Like I already knew like the next like big company that I wanted to build. And like, this is just going to be like a distraction. It's like, I, I don't want to have a side hustle. I don't want to be distracted by this thing. And there's a whole market out there for micro acquisitions. There's mm -hmm. even, um, there's even a company called acquire.com mm -hmm. that's literally built around like Andrew Gazdecki. He's amazing. If you, if you guys want to follow someone in the software space on Twitter, follow Andrew. He's amazing. Um, but yeah, he literally has a marketplace that's for this, for these like 10 to hundred thousand dollar acquisitions of just like these software companies that are pretty basic that just solve one problem really well. And, uh, anyway, so there's a whole market for that. And we actually listed on micro acquire and we got some inquiries, but then I was like, Hmm. Like who has like a large following of agency owners <laughs> that like might get value from this software. So you reached out to him directly. And, uh, yeah. And I was like, Iman, like, let me, let me just text Iman. And like Iman, Iman, Iman and I have been friends for years. Like mm. we, we connected in 2017. We hung out in London a couple of years back. So we've always stayed in touch. So I shot him a text and I'm like, Hey bro, like I've got this software that does this. And it's like built for agency owners to like consolidate their data. And we're doing this much in revenue. And I just want to get rid of it because I'm building something else. I don't want like, I don't want to be distracted by it. Like, mm. do you want it? And he goes, yeah, bro, I'll buy it. Like name your price. I'm like, okay, well like, here's my price. This is like, this is like how much we put in. And like, I want to make a little bit of profit obviously. So like, this is what I'm willing to sell it to you for. And he's like, cool. Like, yeah. Let's just jump on a zoom call and figure out the details. We jump on a zoom call. It's like, 30 minutes we're just like shooting the shit i'm just giving him like the rundown on the numbers and then he's like all right cool like yeah just let me know like send like send me wire info like i'll send the money and then yeah like a week later he sent the money and we just transferred him the domain and the the database and that was it super simple <laughs> yeah it makes sense it could yeah. benefit his user base exactly yeah you didn't need it anymore yeah that makes a lot of sense and i love the story about both your ideas because they both came from firsthand experiencing the problem. That is the biggest thing in software. If you try to build software where you don't deeply understand the problem or you don't deeply understand the customer, you're never going to succeed because you'll always be one step behind a competitor that does. I think that's a lot of like people don't understand the big companies, like the ones in the hundreds of millions or billions are the ones who have just built these softwares for their company. Yeah. And that's why they're able to scale because they have advantages or they have better information or they can communicate more quickly so they save time so they can talk to 20% more customers a day. Yeah. And so like these internal softwares for companies are what make them great. And yeah. so if you have the problem firsthand, you work at a company and your job is something and then you have the problem, that's a huge opportunity for you to just go build an MVP in, on the side and then start trying to use it at your company or sell it to other companies. Like, yeah. That's just a tried and true. And method. I think this is one of the biggest points like we were talking about before the podcast. Like this is one of the things that I wanna drive home. It's not hard to start a software company in this mm -hmm. day and age. All you have to do is find a product with an API, a mm -hmm. software with an API, that has an underserved segment of the market. So with media kits, we found that analytics were convoluted and they didn't talk to each other across platforms. So we took all these social media APIs, we built a really nice uh, UI on top of it. Just, and just show like a UI is just the analytical dashboard. Exactly, it means user interface. It means like what you can see, like, so there's the front end and back end in software. The front end is what you can see. The back end is the code that makes it all appear on the screen, right? And so, yeah, basically, if you find a, an API and productize it, you can sell that and you've got a software business. And that's literally what I've done. All three of my software companies have just been productized APIs. With media kits, it was social media APIs. With agency reporting, it was the API of this CRM platform. Mm -hmm. And then with my newest company, it's APIs of these like small business point of sale softwares. Have you been plugging in AI APIs? Of course. <laughs> we can talk about that. <laughs> I'll, we'll save that for the end, but I think yeah. that's like, this is like the biggest generation for our age. Like yeah, absolutely. The, our parents or the generation before us had the internet. We have AI. Every software is going to use AI. No software has AI. Just a big opportunity. There's no other absolutely. way to Absolutely. And no code, APIs, no code, SaaS builders like Bubble. It's never been easier. And so I think the reason most people 
say that software is not for beginners is because it's only not for beginners who have no experience working anywhere because you don't know the problems that exist. Yep. You have to have a job or be working on something every day to see a problem. Yeah. But now with the no code tools that you mentioned earlier, like if you see a problem, you can build it without knowing how to code. There's API no code, like make.com or Zapier. Yep. And then you can literally just start bringing it to market without having to put any money into it. So now the best business model is beginner friendly. Yeah. You just have to find an idea and then validate it by taking surveys. Yeah. Fun fact, my business partner Caden's on make.com's homepage because he's uh, really? like a power user of, of make.com. Yeah. We've been using, <laughs> we've been doing exactly this. Like that's what yeah. we're doing. Exactly what your new business is. Yeah. Let's just go ahead and go into that. So you sold the micro SaaS, the agency software yeah. because you saw one micro problem on go high level yeah. and saw that they don't like show one aspect of the analytics. Yeah. So you just made this for yourself. You realize hundreds of other people could benefit from it. And then you sold it to someone that serves those people. Yeah. Super straightforward. And again, you just happen to know Iman personally, but you could have sold it on acquired. Yeah. No, I want, I want to, yeah, I want to, uh, say that too. Like we had offers on acquire.com. Iman was just willing to do the deal faster and, yeah, and, of course. you know, and, and easier. Like there's a lot of paperwork no involved. Commission, no fee. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. No commission, et cetera. Like acquire.com is an incredible platform. And if Iman had said no to buying agency reporting, I can guarantee it would have sold on, on acquire.com mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, you see sales all, all the time on there. Like I know someone who literally just makes the same CRM every single month he makes one a month makes the same crm and just Dude, sells it on there for 30 there are, grand <laughs> there are people that make millions of dollars a year just building software companies building no code software companies or just mm -hmm. productizing an api selling them on acquire.com they're making millions of dollars a year yeah it's literally just like this guy makes he just connects the analytics and makes a crm for one specific industry and then just sells that to one company and then plugs in their actual api keys exactly and so they get their analytics he could make it and then productize it but then you have to like he just doesn't want to do it. So he just likes making it, selling it. It's kind of like an agency almost, like an yeah. internal dashboard agency. Yeah. It's cool. But okay, so this this product had product market fit, your micro SaaS, and it was clearly working and you could have scaled it. So why, but you saw a bigger opportunity. Yeah. So even without that validation, you still chose to pursue this one that you didn't have validation on. Yeah. First off, how did you find this problem? Yeah. And tell me if you want to go into it. Yeah, sure. So, so I'll talk about it at a high level, but um, we did have validation on this one um, because I've been doing this. So th it might seem like on this podcast, like I've kind of all over the place, but I've kind of, I've always done one thing. Um, and for a long time, like when I was 16 years old, my very first job in high school was working in an auto repair shop. Mm. So I've always been a car guy. I've okay. always been in the automotive industry. So my first agency was for- This is how you got with JR, which is exactly. Media kits. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So yeah, Media Kits was like a weird tangent. Like it was like a consumer SaaS company in like the influencer marketing space, mm -hmm. which is so foreign to what I was used to. Like my first two businesses were both in automotive. Mm. And so, and even like agency reporting, we built that for my automotive marketing agency, right? So everything like the non-sexy stuff in my career has always been in the auto repair industry, which is kind of crazy because it's like one of the most unsexy industries yeah. ever. But, um, but it's an underserved industry and it's, it's an industry that I know very intimately and that I've been involved in for like a long time. And uh, yeah, basically we're building uh, kind of an AI powered vertical SaaS company mm. for, uh, for the auto repair industry. And mm. that, that's Damn. my new venture. I'm telling you, like I c I'm gonna scream it on my YouTube channel for the last four or five months. And I really feel like people aren't like grasping first how important his speed is, but how big of an opportunity this is right now. Like this is like drop shipping in 2014, 2015, SMA at 2016. Like it's, you can scale it to the highest level and you don't even have to make the product anymore. You just plug in an API. It's fucking crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like to your point, like, uh, so open AI, you know, went viral back in November, December for yep. launching chat GPT. Um, the irony about that is, so GPT-3 has been around for years. Yeah. And there, there's actually a bunch of companies that are multi-million dollar companies Jasper. that started, mm -hmm. Jasper is a great example, that started back in 2016, 17, 18, mm -hmm. just productizing GPT-3 and then chat GPT for some reason is probably just the UI. Ironically, um, I didn't even really think about that until just now, but like literally chat GPT was an internal tool that was just a productized API mm -hmm. of something that already existed at mm -hmm. OpenAI. Mm -hmm. So if you th think about it that way, like that is the epitome of what we're talking about mm -hmm. is what OpenAI did with ChatGPT. But furthermore, um, 
you know, these large language models have APIs. So a lot of these AI startups that you're seeing out there, all they are is OpenAI's API with a wrapper around it mm -hmm. that's geared towards a specific industry. And like, you can build a big business doing that. You, yeah. Like that's why they were, but that's specifically why they released the API to yeah. then see, cause they don't have like, there's only a like hundred people there. They don't have the creativity or knowledge in these industries to know all the different ways it can be used. Yeah. Since it's such a broad thing. So they open it up and give these people access to the APIs, then collect all the data on who's actually using it. Yeah. And then they'll make better decisions from there. And there's so they also, want you to. yeah, there's also this concept of guardrails. So GPT-4, GPT 3.5, like these large language models, they have access to all of the information on the internet, mm -hmm. but they, they don't have the context mm -hmm. to put guardrails up around what's important and not important in a certain context. So to, to make that even simpler, um, for a dentist office, like sure, you could just use the raw API from, from OpenAI to respond to somebody who wants to book an appointment at your dentist office. Mm -hmm. But what would be even more important is if you can provide context and guardrails, almost like at a bowling alley, like the little things that pop yeah. up on the side, like that is what the big opportunity is. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a dentist or you own a dentist marketing agency and you can go and say, all right, I have all of this data from previous customers or from their point of sale software or whatever it might be. And I know X, Y, Z needs to happen before they can make their appointment. Or I know that they, um, we're supposed to get braces last time and they didn't right now I can build that into my product mm -hmm. and it's going to inform this open AI, uh, endpoint to say something with more context. So, you know, instead of being kind of like this very generic, uh, mm -hmm. you know, text generation, you can actually make it industry specific by giving it more data that's contextual to that specific use case. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, we can dive into that if, if we want to get more tactical I mean, that's all, with it. When but. people say they're training AI, that's yeah. all they're doing yeah. is like, say you're a dentist and yeah. you recommend one type of toothpaste. Yeah. And so, and then they want to ask, what's the best toothpaste? You don't want them to answer your competitor's toothpaste. You want yeah. them to answer exactly what you recommend. You did a much better job so of you simpli so simplifying you train it. train it, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's kind of like the private data. That's what Stable Diffusion's whole business model is. Exactly. They give everyone access to the large language model, but then they go ahead and train private companies, private data for their own use case. For exactly, them. exactly. Like, every company needs that, every company. Yeah. So it's massive. If I were to start a bootstrapped SaaS company for the very first time in 2023, I would take a large language model API like OpenAI. I would take a no code platform like Bubble, and then I would go find a really niche, very unobvious problem mm -hmm. in a specific industry and I would solve it using contextual data compi combined with, so, so contextual data from an API, from something that's already in that industry, combined with the large language model from OpenAI. And I would use that to create a product that solved that problem really, really well. And then I would sell it on acquire.com for 500 grand. Pause the video, go back 30 seconds, watch that three times until you exactly understand what he means because that is exactly what me and my partner are doing and I have not told him that. <laughs> word for word, what me and my partner are doing out of all opportunities we could do with our network and everything. That's what we're doing and he said that without knowing that I'm doing that. I did not. And yeah. if you think he's a smart person, if you think maybe I'm a smart person, rewatch that and really internalize what he just said. But yeah. You're doing it, do you want to share the industry overall? Yeah, we're, we're doing it in the auto repair industry. Because you're so. only solely really because you're a car guy, I would yeah. say. Yeah, car guy and just happen to have like a lot of cool like uh, knowledge and connections in that industry. And so it's just something that I'm very familiar with. That's another really important thing. Yeah. We're doing it in the real estate industry. Neither me and my partner have any experience in the real estate industry, but we have a friend here who is killing it in the yeah. real estate industry. And that's such a big market. So it's like, choose the big market, find a specific non-sexy problem, make the UI better and add AI anywhere you can. First one to do it, it's just like a no brainer playbook in my yeah. opinion. You know, the less sexy the problem is the better. Um, there's somebody on Twitter called Cody Sanchez. She's, mm -hmm. yeah, so she's an investor in my new boring company. Business. Oh really? Yep. That's and cool. she talks about boring businesses mm -hmm. and that's literally, she buys laundromats for a living. It's the <laughs> most unsexy thing ever. But if you can build- soft, And car washes too, right? And car washes, yeah. <laughs> if you can build software for laundromats, or car washes or dentists or whatever it is and do exactly what I just said, like there's a big business opportunity there. 
again, it's like the mobile app change. Like every company already had a website, but now it's mobile app, so you can, that's an opportunity. Make them their mobile app. And now every company will need AI, so you just make them their AI version. Most of them aren't going to figure it out internally. And so yeah. if you just make it for the industry you're in, and then you can sell that to other people. You know the unfortunate part, Brett? This video is going to get, I don't know, tens, hundreds of thousands of views, and 99% of the people listening are not going to do anything about it. I can't. It's not complicated. Like, yeah. we are, we, like, we have four developers on our team, yeah. and we're choosing Bubble and Make.com. We're choosing both no code yeah. to learn it. I'm going to look in the camera right now, <laughs> and I'm going to say, if you are listening to this podcast and you are one of the people that actually takes action on things and that actually listens and applies the information that you're finding on the internet, like this video, like you did not end up watching this long into this video for no reason, go and actually make an effort to do what we're talking about. Because if you just watch this video and then you skip to the next video and then the next one, and then eventually you forget about this video entirely and you never take action on it, then, you know, there's nothing better I can do to help you. So, and we're not selling anything. <laughs> like, no, we're, this ju is we're just, just what we're doing. We're just hanging out, man. We're just talking about life. Like, I just don't know how else to word it for people. Like, yeah. you don't need to have the problem yourself. Find a friend that's in a big industry and see what problems they have, and then just be the bubble person. Or, or if, if you don't want to start that business, just hit me up and come work for me, and I'll, I'll yeah, teach, you, hire, teach you the ropes. <laughs> yeah, or hire our agencies, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Like, it's not, whatever. So, but how are you going about, like, actually? building it out or hiring, like finding your developers or what's your team yeah. structure? Uh, this time around, we have a great development team. They're all in-house. We're doing it right. We're doing it. Um, we're doing it like the, the, I guess the more traditional way. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, it's like, you know, this is going to be a big business for us. This isn't, this isn't like sell it on my, on, on acquire.com or anything like mm -hmm. this is like a proper, like multi eight, maybe nine figure business mm -hmm. that, that we're building. And, um, you know, we, we want to have the proper infrastructure to do that. What do you think? Out of all the software companies you've started, like what were problems you ran into that you didn't think would be problems? Or what was something that you basically like believed going into it that turned out to be completely untrue? Mm. Um, build it and they will come is not true. Okay. It's true to an extent. Yeah. And it's, it's not that it's completely untrue. It's just not... Uh, it's not like the most accurate description of how things actually work. Mm. Um, you actually have to market your product, believe it or yeah. not. Like you actually have to get eyeballs on your product for it to work. That should be a core thought process before even choosing what product to make is your ability to get eyeballs on it in the first place, in my opinion. Absolutely. A first time founder focuses more on product than they do on distribution. A second time founder focuses more on distribution than product. Mm. And I am even with product led growth. Absolutely. I am, I am a embodiment of that. We waited way too long to launch media kits. We even talked about that, mm -hmm. right? Because I was too focused on product. I thought the product had to be perfect. Versus this time around, our product has been launched for six months already in, mm -hmm. in a beta. Like we, we've had paying users for six months and we haven't even launched publicly yet. Has the course and of the product changed? From absolutely. What your initial idea was yeah, to absolutely. what it is now? 100%. And this time around, we focused on distribution through partnerships and through... Um, you know, we own one of the largest Facebook groups in our industry. And like, there's these other, ah, like, so you built that first. Yeah, mm. absolutely. So we built the distribution channels before we even built the product mm. versus at media kits, we built the product and then we were scrambling to figure out distribution. So go into the Facebook group. That's kind of interesting. I don't sure, think a lot yeah. of people would think about that. I'm like a huge community guy and I see the value yeah. of that. So explain your thought process. Yeah. Um, yeah, basically we, uh, we started a Facebook group that now has thousands of members in a, in a very specific niche. Um, and we're just in there, thought leadership. We don't even, we don't even sell our software in there. It's literally just for um, business owners in this niche to connect with other business owners. And that's, that's literally all it's for. And they just kind of help each other out. They talk about certain things. And then the best part is we don't have to promote our software because our customers will promote our software for us in mm -hmm. this Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And so all we have to do is just be the stewards of like, good vibes and like, you know, <laughs> yeah. good conversations. That's like, you know, as long as, as long as nobody's in there selling or promoting anything, mm -hmm. you know, as long as there's no spam, as long as there's no negativity or hate happening in the group, like that's all we're there for is to moderate that. Um, it just grows by word of mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, these people invite their friends yeah. and then our customers will go in there and talk about how amazing our software is without us even having to ask them to do it. Communities are probably the most valuable part of the internet and Absolutely. all you have to do like it sounds, it's not. You create a place 
and then you like just maybe share some resources to start it off, and then you start telling people one by one by one, hey, there's this Facebook group for all car people. There's this Facebook group where you can learn about this and we can share this interest and share our problems. Yeah. And then you get like 20 people in there. They start talking to each other. Yeah. Then someone else comes in. They're like, hey, welcome to the group. And it just starts to like yeah. live. It's like a living, breathing organism. Dude, I think Facebook groups are the most underrated thing in 2023. Facebook like, specifically or just online groups? Facebook groups. Specifically Facebook. Specifically Facebook groups. I use Circle, so why Facebook? I, or Discord, so why Facebook? Well, so for me specifically, like because we're in like, we're selling to small business owners. Like that's where they are. Like that's really the only place they are. That's the only answer to that question. Yes. Um, but no, I, but I, I see your point though. I think Discord communities are great. For younger, um, Discord's for younger people. Absolutely. Circles if you want it proprietary. But yeah. Facebook is where if you're older demographic that are into cars, that's yeah. where they live. Then you make Facebook group. Sure. You pick yeah. one, bait, you need to be intentional, I guess. Yeah. If you can be, and this goes back to like, this, this is the human nature in general. This goes back to like Casey and I throwing those parties mm-hmm. in, a, in the Hollywood Hills to, mm-hmm. to network and meet people. Like if you can be the steward of like a good time or a positive environment for people to hang out and meet peers, mm-hmm. like you will be seen as an authority in that industry, mm-hmm. right? And so it's like, I had no business, like the, the founder of MySpace came to one of my parties in LA that Casey and I threw. And like, I have his cell phone number now because of that. And, and this is just, it's just one random example, but like no 19 year old kid has, has enough, like enough credibility to, to like hang out with the founder of MySpace for three hours at some crazy mansion in the Hollywood Hills. The only reason that that happened for me and for Casey is because we were the stewards of this event Mm -hmm. and he wanted to meet the people that put it on. And this same thing goes for online communities, Mm -hmm. right? It's like, if I can bring a bunch of like-minded people together on the internet or you on circle, Mm -hmm. you, if you can do that and bring people together and and have them enjoy what they're doing and have a great time and and talk and network, and you're the one that's facilitating it, like you're going to reap the rewards of being that facilitator. So community is everything on the internet. And, but the reason he does this for your SAS and you're doing it preemptively, because this is a, this would have been a good answer. You didn't do it with media kits, I guess, but, when you're building the product, this is a perfect answer. Build yeah. a community of people that have that same problem preemptively. Yeah. So then you have a group of 3,000 people that you can then be like, oh, and magically, guys, out of nowhere, I found this software <laughs> tool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But we created it, but I think it'll help you guys because it helped us a lot. And then now, so you fostered that. Now you have your core user base and there's a Facebook group for them to give you feedback and iterate, which you're already benefiting yep, from. Yep. It's genius. And so same thing goes for like, that's why I have my YouTube channel. Like, yeah. I was talking about a way different subject a year and a half ago Then I make a video on AI when ChatGPT came out. It's not when the API came out, but when ChatGPT came out, got popular, I understood the concept, made a video on it. Now I'm thinks I'm an AI guy. Yeah, I'm and- not like some huge AI expert. I get how it's good for people and how it's going to benefit in business. Yeah, but like but on the internet, how people perceive you. Yeah, and there and there's always like there's always got to be somebody who can articulate information in a digestible way. Yeah. And even like the example earlier that you made where I tried to explain something and then you explained it way simpler than I did. It's like, that's, that's a skill, like that's superpower. And I think that's why your content does well. It is solely my intention. Like yeah. I optimize for understanding in as few words as possible. Yeah. That's the goal of the channel. Yeah. So I to, I'm glad, I appreciate you saying that. Yeah, of course. But brother, you are super successful in software and that's what we're tackling right now. So this is something that I'm actually genuinely interested in. And so have you found like any sort of like actual marketing channels outside of organic product led growth that worked for you guys? Like you said you used TikTok with Josh Richards, but he was an investor. Did you guys try Facebook ads? Anything you didn't see working? Um, I mean, yeah, we've, we've done everything. We've done Facebook ads, TikTok ads, Snapchat ads. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, my, my new company is a lot of like in-person like uh, trade shows and, and, mm. and expos and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's different for every SaaS company. I think you just, the fundamental question you need to ask, because I, I don't want to, I don't want to go into a whole monologue about Facebook ads, even though I, even though we could, um, if it's not applicable for you. But like, as a, as a software founder, what you have to ask yourself is, where do my customers live? Where do they hang out? Where do they spend their time? And then where are my competitors hanging out and spending their time? Mm. And that should lead you to the answer to that question of how do I market to these when people? When you say competitors, you more so mean where are they like marketing to? If you take one of your customers and open up their credit card statement, all the other businesses that they're buying from, where do those businesses find 
your customer. So how are they marketing? Yeah. And then just do what they're doing essentially. Yeah. Okay. Well, well don't, don't copy what they're doing, but understand that there are certain channels in certain ways, whether it's, um, you know, like inbound, outbound selling, like, you know, uh, organic marketing, paid, paid marketing, like whatever it might be. Like there's so many different marketing avenues and strategies and channels that you can utilize, but you have to first understand which ones your customers are actually on and mm. where they spend their time and, and their attention. And odds are if they've, if they're marketing on those platforms, they've been in the business for years, they probably have figured that one out. So yeah, just, exactly. Like, take an educated guess yeah. that they didn't, <laughs> they know what they're doing. Yeah. Okay. So who do you learn from? Cause you found success really young. How old are you now? 23. Yeah. You're still really young. <laughs> you're killing it. So where did you learn this from? Um, so I think that I've always, I, I like to think that I'm like a student of life. Like I just love, I love just digesting information. And it was a really weird uh, pivot for me, like from like the internet marketing world to like the venture backed like startup world. Those are two very different communities that very rarely overlap. Ironically, uh, Jasper is a great example mm -hmm. of one company that did overlap because those guys came from like the marketing internet world. marketing world and now they're like mm -hmm. a big VC backed SaaS company. But it's very rare. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I try to consume content kind of from all sides, whether it's like, you know, a, a, a keynote on venture capital by Sam Altman or something like mm -hmm. that on YouTube or, you know, a video by Iman or, or by you. Like, I'm, I'm always trying to just kind of learn from everybody that has different perspectives on things and take the things that apply to my business and, and, and apply them. Um, and I think that's one of, that's one of the skills that, that um, if people can learn that early is, is really powerful is understanding that not every piece of advice, even not every piece of advice that Brett and I are giving you in this video is going to be applicable to what you're doing, but there's at least something I'm sure. And if you can identify what that is and then take it and actually take action on it, then, you know, that's the most important part. So again, software is like really honestly straightforward to see success with. If you can see a problem it's, it's, and you can fix the problem, yeah. it'll work for you. It'll work for somebody else. Now you just need to tell other people that this solution exists. It's simple. It's not easy. That's a really good That's, that's what I like to say. Why do you think, I guess the barriers to entry, you raised money for your new one? Yeah, I did. Why a did a little bit, strategically. So you All literally strategic. just found investors that you think could get you into those type of businesses exactly. that you sold yeah. for. Yeah. And so you're, this is the, now you have the mindset of giving them the opportunity. And then it's a no brainer because they know they have yeah. the connections. Yeah. Huh. And, and of course, like the second time around, you know, once you have like an exit under your belt, it, it instills a lot more confidence in investors. Mm. They're like, oh, he's done this before. He knows what he's doing, right? And that's why uh, I say that to say that it's really important, in my opinion, that everybody's first business is bootstrapped. I do not recommend raising money for your very first business. I do not recommend starting a software company as your very first business. I think if you can start a professional services business, a marketing agency, something similar to that, Iman talks about this all the time on his YouTube channel. If you can start as a freelancer, turn that into an agency, turn that into a cash flowing business, have some cash and then start something like, you know, even um, to use Oliver as an example, again, like a CPG company that's mm -hmm. selling physical goods, CPG and software are very similar in the fact that they have very high startup costs. Mm -hmm. You're not going to do that as a first time entrepreneur. You have to sell something that's scalable, that has low overhead, like marketing services or, or some sort of agency model that you can do to stack some cash, get some experience then you've kind of like earned the right to move mm -hmm. into something like D2C or, or software. Mm -hmm. and, and I truly feel that way. And the cool thing is you can start a services business that's in the same niche mm -hmm. as the software company that you mm -hmm. might want to eventually start, right? You, did, you were a marketing agency for car people. Exactly, yes. So that, that's a great example. Like if you can go and figure out the pain points of a certain industry by providing services to them that, you know, something that's unscalable, that's, that's not sexy, that's not, you know, gonna get, get, get you some crazy multiple or some crazy acquisition, but purely just to learn about your target customer and to learn how to run a business and file your taxes and just yeah. the, the basic stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can go and, and start a software business. I do believe that like your first business has to be a service agency business of some exactly. sort. It could be mowing lawns. You could yeah. have a m lawn mowing business and then the people that are booking your services don't like, they are just calling you on the phone. You're like, what if I just made a marketplace for people in my local area 
to find people to mow their lawn. Yeah. That's your software company. And you yeah. can build that on Bubble with a template with no code. The Absolutely. Lawn mowers of Arizona, even though there's no grass here, you might not see a lot of success. <laughs> yeah, maybe not here. <laughs> but if that makes sense in your area, you just sell that as a service. Then you see a problem that people are having a hard time booking people. And then you make a software company around that and you just use those people and they're like, oh, I don't like it, it's clunky, I'd rather just call you. Then maybe you have a bad product. You're, you're making me want to go start an artificial turf company here <laughs> yeah. in Arizona. But that's how, like, a service is literally anything just so you can learn the problem space. Yeah. And then you can build a software out of that because objectively software is the best business model. But it's not maybe, so it's good, software is beginner friendly, but not first business friendly. Not first time friendly, yeah. Not first time. Yeah. So you could, it could be your first business if you understand a business if you have yeah. a job and you, you, you need to have some conceptual context. understanding of how to run a business and and at least some conceptual understanding of how software works and how it scales and how to get distribution and if you've worked in a business you understand how a business works for sure i think another another great thing i i really <laughs> like to push back against this idea on like on youtube and like this whole like internet marketing like kind of like self-help industry i think pushes like the anti-college anti-job kind of narrative and i completely disagree with that i i, I push it hard my next video is very anti-college anti-job well, so so here's but, the thing that's but fine push it, but that's Fine. So and for context, I've never had a job and I didn't yeah. go to college. Me neither. Well, I did go to college. The, the point that I'm making though is I think sometimes for some people, it might be good to go and get a job at a company that's mm -hmm. similar to a, a to an, in an industry that's similar oh, to yeah. something that you want to start a business in. And I think sometimes you might even learn more doing that oh, yeah. than trying to start something from scratch and just failing over mm -hmm. and over again. And I am anti-college 1,000%. Yeah. Not anti-job necessarily. I wouldn't. I don't think I could ever do it yeah. unless it was for that specific reason. If yeah. I was so aware of what I wanted to do for a living, so intentionally, then it would make sense to go work for a company to learn the industry, learn the tools they use, learn how they communicate, and learn their problems. Yeah. Then go do it myself. But it would have to be hyper intentional. Yeah. I just don't think people that are just starting out at 18 are even close to knowing what industry they want to work in. Yeah. And so they don't do that. But yeah, that's a really good point. But going and just going and just working for a business that's run by an entrepreneur that is like an entrepreneurial culture mm -hmm. is it doesn't even matter what industry is in. You're going to learn so much about mm -hmm. how to run a business, how to do customer service, how to you know take care of your employees. Like there's so many things that are intangible that you and I probably had to learn the hard way because we've never worked somewhere. Yeah. Oh, my right. God. Yeah, it's yeah. like I think about this all the time. I'm like, just I'm like, there. damn, like. Things like HR and like <laughs> payroll taxes and like all these things that I, I don't know how they work because I've never been on the flip side. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, oh man, like if I had just worked a regular job for like a year, I would probably know how these things work, but mm -hmm. I don't. And so I have to figure it out on the fly. And you pay for that. Yeah, exactly. You literally pay for that. Yeah. Like, yeah. That lack of knowledge. And typically you just have to hire someone who then has done it before. And then that's exactly. the only way you do learn. Exactly. <laughs> Interesting. So do you think that I just don't know, like, what, how, what age were you when you started consuming YouTube? Oh, like 15, 14? Because I, I feel know. like all, everyone I've had on this podcast, all of us in our circle, all lived the same life. 14 to 15 years old, we were all yeah. watching the e-com, SMMA, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we all kind of went to these networking events out in California. And Dude. then we all met, and then now everyone's at this 22 to 25 range, making hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Dude, that's how, that's how Iman and I met. I was making SMMA content on YouTube when like I had like a couple thousand subscribers and so did Iman. He had like a couple thousand subscribers and this is back in like 2016, like late 2016. And he like shot me a DM, I still have it. I, I went back and like read it the other day cause I was like, I was like looking at his channel. I'm like, damn, I'm so proud of this guy. Mm -hmm. Like this is crazy. But like he reached out to me, he's like, hey Kieran, like, you know, great to connect. Like I like like your SMMA content on YouTube's cool. And like, we just kind of hit it off and we've stayed in touch ever since. And now he's like the biggest creator on the oh, platform dude, his growth the last in year, that industry. It's like, and it's, it's so impressive. Yeah. But he just takes everything so seriously and it's just yeah. become such quality. So he deserves every Absolutely. inch of it. But it's also interesting to me to see, and he's so young, dude. Yeah. He's just been in the game since he was 14. It's so cool. Yeah. But uh, it's cool for me to see also, cause I'm a little older, I'm 26. And so I'm starting to see like this, like, cause I was watching Iman when I was like five years yeah. ago in my SMA. Yeah. But now we're seeing like these new wave of like a new generation of influencers all in the same coming up with no code SaaS, AI, yeah. the new like generation, businesses of the future is what I call them. Yeah. And so it's really cool to see that, that it's like, it works. we kind of laid that framework down. Cause it's like almost yeah. like one of the first generations of like internet money kids. 
running Facebook ads. Dude, I, the gurus abused everybody. Yeah. Like, we just went through it. I love, I love uh, Bia Heza. Yeah, He's like oh, one dude. of my favorites. And then there's this kid called uh, Caden Boof. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've seen him on TikTok, mm -hmm. but you gotta check it out. He's hilarious. He'll take like these, these like super basic concepts, like like mowing lawns and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And he'll, he'll just go out and like make a bunch of money doing it. But he has like this comedic effect to it. And the videos are hilarious. The kid's like 17 or 16. What's the angle? Is it like, cause it's, e like it's easy? He's or just like, showing people how easy it is to go out yeah. and make money doing stuff. Almost everyone's just like in their mind. In yeah, their but, room. but he makes it into like a skit. So it's hilarious. But anyway, yeah, I, like there's so many kids <laughs> doing this and it's, it's incredible to see. So I also find it so interesting of like the influencer dynamic of like, growing a following, then do you start the business or start the business, then grow a following? And so I do want to ask you, because you made YouTube videos like way back in the day and you have what, like over like probably 11, 12 K yeah, at this something point, like that. Yeah. but you have videos with hundreds of thousands of views, but you took a, when you started media kits, you stopped. Yeah. So, and I still, I, I've been like basically not on the internet for like the last six months because I've been building my new business. You sold everything. I, in Bali. Yeah, I did. Um, I'm of the opinion that like, so my new business, my new business does not benefit from my personal brand at all. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just not like my, my, my personal brand is like in the same space as like younger guys that are like up and coming in business. And like, I'm selling to, you know, brick and mortar, small business owners yeah. with my new, my new company. So I just kind of made the decision. Like my personal brand has been amazing to me over the last six years. It's allowed me to connect with guys like you and Iman and Casey mm -hmm. and JR and all these guys. And it's amazing. But for me, like, I've just recognized that I've, I've picked a lane that doesn't require me to be like on the internet. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of taken a step back. Do you prefer that? I do. I think it's more peaceful. Um, and I don't want my business to be dependent on me, uh, because it's less sellable. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I think there are people that do it really well. Like there's plenty of people that have a personal brand that's really big and also a business that's mm -hmm. unrelated that makes a bunch of money mm -hmm. and that's great. But, if, if somebody's business relies on their personal brand, that's just, that's not for me. It's not something that I want to do because I don't see it. I don't see it as having longevity. Mm -hmm. I so. prefer to talk to people who don't have personal brands because even though I'm in this group too, like a lot of the success of your business, if it's from a personal brand is solely because of your personal brand. And that actually almost is the business, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and yeah. that's why you're successful. So when I can talk to people who don't have a huge following, but their business is making millions, it's like, you know, it's because their tactics and their product was so good. Yeah. And everybody, everybody realizes this eventually. Like you see all these influencers launching product lines mm -hmm. that are like branded separately and yep. like all these things. And, uh, even Iman, like his software company, it's like, yeah, it benefits from his personal brand, but like, hopefully they he'll be able alone. to, to keep that alone. separate. Yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, people, people realize this eventually. And, and, you know, I think for me, it's like, maybe I'll come back on YouTube and Instagram one day and like try to grow my personal mm -hmm. brand in, in, you know, in the next few years. But for now, um, kind of just keeping a low profile. I mean, I guess that's why, but I guess why Alex Ramosi came back like so heavy for sure. To YouTube for sure. Yeah, Cause he saw how like powerful, like Kylie Jenner and well, Mr. Beast were, but he also sold his business and it was, yeah, yeah. it was like, that's it. And he was doing something different yeah, yeah. now. So now he has a really cool model. Yeah. The acquisition.com model is really cool. Why did you sell everything and move to Bali? <laughs> I, you, um, don't, you don't know how much time, how many times I fantasized about that. Dude, I even texted you. I was dude, like, dude, dude, dude. I know, what, I know, it man. Like? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it was amazing. Yeah. So for context, I lived in Bali for four months, mm -hmm. um, and it was it was a few things. So s selling media kits was like it's a big thing for me because it was like my identity. Like it's all I did for two and a half, three years. Mm -hmm. It's all I was focused on, and so having that weight off my shoulders, like you know, investors, employees, like you know, a bunch like issues with the software well, bugs can i all. ask you about that one what was it like yeah. was having investors really stressful it wasn't stressful like on a day-to-day -day basis but like on a macro level yeah because like you owe people money and you got to make sure yeah, they psychologically get paid back. i think that would really yeah. impact me yeah so it was you know it was the first time in my life where i had no responsibilities or obligation like when i sold media kits i stayed at the company for a little while and then i then i left um and i had no responsibilities i had gotten rid of my apartment I had, uh, I had sold all my cars. I had sold media kits. Um, and I literally just had zero obligation. I had no employees. I had no investors. I had nothing. I was just free. And I was like, I knew I wanted to build my next SaaS company. And you know, my, so my business partner, Caden and I were like, all right, where can we go for like 90 days to just lock in and be focused? Time zone doesn't matter. Um, you know, distance doesn't matter. Um, you know, 
price to a certain extent doesn't really matter because like we're just going to go somewhere nice and just enjoy it and like especially like in your early 20s like having like basically no responsibilities i don't have a dog or anything like i don't have a girlfriend you're like, a car guy i'm surprised dude, you I'm sold like, the r8 yeah you know I'd, I'd owned it for like two and a half years so i was kind of ready for the next thing but um but yeah man it was just great like being able to go there and just live out of a suitcase for four months and just do was whatever there an i wanted intention? like was there like a clear goal like an outcome you wanted or like to build my next company to, to decide what it was or you already had the idea we already had the idea okay. it was to build the mvp gotcha and also Perfect. That was on like the business side. It was to build the MVP for my next business. And then on the personal side, it was to kind of like, just to, like, this sounds super cliche, but like rediscover myself. Like mm -hmm. what are my core values and beliefs? What do I want the next three to five years of my life to look like? How am I going to kind of like reinvent myself after media kits? Because so much of my personal brand and my like reputation was wrapped up in media kits. And I, I wanted to you know pivot away from that. Um, you know, Hormozy has even talked about this recently. He uses the example with, um, who's the actor from Wolf of Wall Street? Leo? Uh, no, the, the other guy. Jonah Hill? Um, the, the oh. Uh, oh, yeah. Matthew McConaughey? Matthew McConaughey, yeah. I think Hermosi made a video about this. He's like, Matthew McCona <laughs> McConaughey used to do, like, rom-coms, and then he disappeared for a couple of years and came back, did, like, you know, more serious characters. And, like, I kind of went through the same thing. It's like, you go through these ebbs and flows in your life mm -hmm. and your career, like, almost like these character arcs, where it's like, Kieran O'Brien, the, the marketer, like, mm -hmm. the internet marketer guy, and then it's like Kieran O'Brien, the SaaS founder in like the influencer space. And so, you know, 23 years old now, having gone through the kind of those two phases, I'm like this, this next one is is a whole different identity. It's a whole different kind of like like brand and, and it's a whole different way that, of, that I want people to think about me and, and more importantly that I wanna think about myself. And so it was kind of just like a reset. It was like, I was off social media. I deleted everything off my phone. It was just like a cleanse. Hmm. So it's almost like people are, the world's always trying to put you in a box to like categorize you and understand you. Yeah. But I love the fact that people like Kanye West was like the best one at like yeah. completely reinventing yeah. himself, dude. And I've Great always example. respected that. Yes. Yeah. Cause he used to be the shutter shades guy when I was in yeah. middle school. Then he went to Yeezus, which was completely opposite. Now he's a so, fashion brand. Like now he's sometimes, crazy. <laughs> sometimes you just got to change your environment to be able to see things like from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So I highly recommend, Oh yeah. You know, if, if any like young people are watching, like, go out and see the world like you, you don't have to have a bunch of money to do it either like mm -mm. you know you, you can these businesses we're talking about starting you could do that from your laptop from anywhere you like evolve as a person if, if you go to like a third world country or like not necessarily third world but like i went to the country colombia by myself oh yeah like traveled there by myself for one of my agency clients and trying to just communicate with people who don't speak english and, it's a, and then like a meal's two dollars like dude your whole world view shifted yeah traveling to a third world country and then more importantly what you just mentioned solo travel is so important. Like I think everybody should do a multiple week, if not multiple month long solo trip somewhere with mm -hmm. no friends. Cause it's hundred percent on you to figure out and solve every problem you're facing. Exactly. And then you don't have Wi-Fi half the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's such a, it's such a paradigm shift and it's, it's just like a different perspective on life. And, um, yeah, I, I recommend it to everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. So what have you thought about, like, as you've come back from that, have you like tried to like, I feel like there's a huge shift in like team size going down. Are you like optimizing for like the most lean team possible? Or do you like view this as like, I want to make this a thousand person company? No, headcount is not a measure of success. And that one of the things in Silicon Valley, it always used to be. It's raising like, money, how many employees raise, do you have? Raising money and how many employees do you have? It's like, th those are stupid metrics. Mm -hmm. No, what's your EBITDA? What's your revenue? You know, what's your net retention? What's your, what's your revenue per employee? Like those are the things that I care about. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for this new venture, like, I'm focusing on quality of people way more than quantity of people. And one A player is worth five C players. How have you gone about finding them? I think it's just intuition, man. And like, this is one of the things like, it's all of this stuff when I was coming up, when I was like, basically like a freelancer running my agency, I, I always thought stuff like, stuff like culture and stuff like, um, you know, your values and your mission statement <laughs> and all this stuff. I thought it was like cliche and kind of stupid, but if you actually do it right and you actually like do it in a way that's that's profound and that that people can get behind and like turn it into like a real movement mm -hmm. um then you know the the results of that are like crazy there's, so there's more fulfillment that people can get out of like working on a problem that feels important yeah than, absolutely than just money like, yeah especially people who aren't naturally entrepreneurs they want to feel like they are important at the job they're playing a big role and they're working on something that's actually making the world a better place 
Yeah, hundred percent. And you have to be, you have to evolve so much as a leader mm -hmm. to attract. And a lot of it, like the law of attraction is very real in every aspect of, of life. And to attract a player talent, you have to be an A play and like an A plus leader. Mm -hmm. Right. And not saying that I am, I'm working towards it every single day. I, I don't think anybody's a perfect leader, but like I've been like another thing I did in Bali is I studied leadership a lot and I read a mm -hmm. lot of books and um, really went down like this rabbit hole of like human psychology and how that like relates to leadership. And so, you know, for, for people that are watching, if you're thinking about, you know, starting like an AI startup or starting like a no code, like a bubble company or, or starting a lawn mowing business, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. Um, eventually you'll get to a point where you need to start hiring employees and building a team and understanding how to do that in a way that builds real culture and that actually gets buy-in from your team members and like truly does that right. Not just, you know, like the facade of doing it where people stick around for six months and then they leave. Mm -hmm. Like if you can really nail that, like business at a high level is a people game and that's it. Like mm -hmm. product IP patents, trademarks, you know, all that stuff. It doesn't matter. You're in the people business. If you can't nail that, then none of the rest of the stuff I just listed really matters too much because it'll just implode. Yeah. It's like human capital. Your, your company is the average value of the average IQ of your company in a way. Yeah. So like if you have really high quality people, you're going to take it way further. So Absolutely. I really, do you like go for all full-time employees or do you lean towards contractors more? Um, we're very contractor heavy. Yeah. So there's no right answer. Um, everybody on our team right now, uh, except for like one person I think is, is full time. Um, and that's very intentional because we want to build the culture in that way. I think, is uh, it, sorry, is it cause sorry, you finish. No, no, you're good. I, I think a hybrid is, is the right approach in, in the beginning, even like this new business that we started, we were a hybrid approach in the beginning. Mm. Um, but like, the status of an employee being a 1099 or a W2 isn't what makes them a contractor, right? It's, it's about how ingrained they are in your culture. And so you can make like someone who's technically like on paper, a contractor, you can make them a part of your culture and then, you know, eventually transition them over to like a full-time position when you're, when you're able to. So that's all semantics. It doesn't matter. Is it more so to sell your company though? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not worried about that. It's, it's like, it's more just, like building, building a team that actually cares about what you're doing, right? Mm. Like a freelancer is not going to care about what you're doing. So I think there's like, there's different types of, of tools in the toolbox, right? It's like, you've got like your exacto knives and you've got like your machetes. It's mm -hmm. like you, you can hire and, and the, the verbiage that I like to use is like missionaries versus mercenaries. Mm -hmm. So your mercenaries, like your, I know this one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, your mercenary is like your machete and your missionary is like your exacto knife. It's like they're, they're for different purposes. And so your, your mercenaries are the freelancers, the guys that are just going to come in, they're going to get shit done, and they're just going to do it because they're getting paid to do it. And there is a time and a place for that in every business. Sometimes there's a time and a place for that in, you know, in a business for a very long time. Even once you have an amazing culture, there's still a place for outside consultants, you know, mercenaries to come in and just, and just do one task really well and then leave. Mm -hmm. Like there, there's absolutely a place for that. Um, but the core of your team should be missionaries. They should be people that are there for the mission that you're on, that are marching with you, that are like side by side, like shoulder to shoulder with you in combat, mm -hmm. so to speak. Like those are the people that you want there day in and day out. And every now and then you might have to bring in a mercenary to get something really specific done. Do you try to optimize for everyone to work in person? Uh, we're balancing that. Um, we're about to open an in-person office here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, we, we do have employees that are in other cities that are uh, in the same city as each other. And mm -hmm. they'll work in person That's together cool. at like a WeWork or something. Yeah, that so, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you were able to achieve a lot of success very young. Like you're still young. But even before your software companies, you were successful. And like, what do you attribute that to? What do you think was in you that like, because so many people like can't ever wrap their head around making $10,000 a month or can't ever wrap their head around even starting their own company. So what like, what was a, how were you able to do that, bro? <laughs> I, you know, I think about this a lot and I don't know like innately what it was. Like I always, as a kid, like I always wanted to, do things like differently. I always had like this, uh, yeah, like I, I had this like 
I, I never did well with authority, like coaches, <laughs> teachers, and stuff like that. I, I always wanted to kind of do things my own way. Uh, lemonade stands, flipping mm-hmm. sneakers on eBay, like I did all that stuff. And I don't know like innately what drove that, but I always think that it was like kind of a fear of being average. Mm-hmm. Like I grew up in a, like a middle-class family. Like I wasn't, I wasn't poor by any means. Like I, I never had to worry about where my next meal was coming from. But like, you know, I went on like a vacation like every other year maybe. And like my, my dad drove a Honda Accord and like we lived in a, like a modest house in a modest neighborhood. And like there just wasn't anything crazy. Like I never, I never saw was he an like- entrepreneur? No, no, but both my, neither of my parents were entrepreneurs. So I didn't even know what the word entrepreneur was until I was like 17. And so I say all that to say that like, I grew up in that like typical like white picket fence type, yeah. you know, type situation. And, you know, sometimes like a lot of people that grow up in very underprivileged situations, they, they hustle because they want to get out of that. And I totally understand and empathize with that. For me, it was more so like, I see the people around me and they're kind of like, they're just scraping by like they're, they're, they're fine. Like they're living for the weekend, essentially. Exactly. Like, I need and the bare minimum to get my next, to get off. Exactly. <laughs> and I just didn't, I didn't resonate with that. I always knew from a young age, I'm like, I want to do, I know there's something beyond this. Like I know there's another level above this that I can get to. Um, and I just wanted that. I didn't even know what it, what it was necessarily. I'm just like, I want to do more with my life than, than what, I'm exposed to on a day-to-day basis. I'm so fascinated by how many, like pure quantity, like 20 to 25 year old millionaires there were 20 years ago or 30 years ago before the internet. It'd be interesting. I know so many kids making 100K a month. So many people that have cracked the code with whether they're a go high level affiliate or they're running an SMMA or drop shipping, whatever it is, there's so many. And it's just because like, if you just fill your mind with the right information on the internet, like just got to do the work at that point. It's just execution, yeah. Like there's, I don't, I just don't get it. How, yeah. uh, whatever. <laughs> I've just yeah. always felt like an entrepreneur naturally. So I've just always been watching these YouTube videos yeah. and then over time just start doing something. One thing leads to the next, one thing leads to the next. You meet better people, cooler people. Yeah. You slowly rise to the top. feels really long in the time, like when you're in it, but. Dude, I want to touch on that too, man. Like the people you do it with is everything, like everything. Like having a friend, having a friend group and a network of people that are like killing it in their own respective ways and being able to be around them and spend time with them. Like that's why like Casey, JR and I, and a a few other people, like we all moved out here, Seb too. Like Mm -hmm. we all moved out here to Scottsdale around the same time. Like when we were all like 17, 18 years old, Mm -hmm. you know? And like, that was, I think I attribute a lot of my success to that. Just being around those guys. Mm -hmm. Like most important thing. We weren't even doing the same stuff. None of us are even in the same industry doing the same thing. We're all doing like the stuff we're doing couldn't be more different in terms of how Mm -hmm. we make money. But we were just around each other and like we'd go to dinners and we'd hang out. And I think that's like a big, big piece of it is just being around like-minded people. I mean, how much has been seeing Ishan's success been motivating you from afar? Oh, like, dude, absolutely. Absurd. Like, I, I love that guy. And so it's just like we're not even remotely in the same industry, but just seeing that makes me want to be better. And so like, yeah. that's so, so critical. And that's what I was seeking for a long time, which is what online communities are also great for, especially yeah. when you're starting. And the problem when everyone is young is I feel like they think money is the issue. And that is like really not the issue from, if you go to 10 to 100K really isn't money. No. It's just information and your team, like the, your, who's, who you're doing it with essentially. Yeah. Have you been, are you doing the next one with Casey? Uh, no, Casey's, uh, Casey's not involved in this one. He's, he's doing his own thing also in the AI space. <laughs> so if you're not doing something, if you're not building AI no code SaaS or AI SaaS, yeah. like, you're, I don't know why, bro. <laughs> yeah, Casey's got a really- Everyone I know. Is yeah. doing an AI SaaS. Casey's got a really cool product. It's basically like uh, you could even use it for, for this episode. It's like AI for podcasts. Oh, cool. So it does like show notes and, and descriptions um, and titles mm. for podcasts. You could just it, upload your audio Will do my uh, timestamps? Timestamps, yeah. You got a customer, bud. There you go. Because <laughs> I hate doing that. <laughs> I'll literally yeah. just do half of it and like loading. Yeah. But that's really cool. Okay. So, but ultimately like you should be doing things for free for people like getting access to higher quality information, getting access to an industry, whatever it is, do a favor for people, show them you have a skill. Yeah. Is there like any skills that you had or like, what are like your most, if you had to like flex right now, 
<laughs> and you're good at something. Like, what are your hard skills? Like, I can say for me, video, lighting. Oh, I'm dude. Oh, nerd. by the way, yeah, dude. Like, this this your my, setup is crazy. This is, I'm a nerd, bro. Yeah, lighting, I love it. I'll talk about lighting for 10 hours if you want. But dude, I need help my, with mine. This is my first. I got you. Yeah. Oh, do you record? Yeah, I just, in my apartment, like, I'm, oh, yeah. like, I'm even just my Zoom call setup, yeah, I need yeah, help. Let me come over. I'll get you um, a nice-ass webcam, the whole shebang. Hell yeah. Uh, I think my skills are, um, like, product and marketing. Mm. And when I say product specifically, I mean, like, understanding consumer psychology and why mm. people want something. Like I, I can look at a software product or I mean, to an extent, like any kind of product, but, um, software products specifically, and, and I can understand why people would want it, why, why they maybe wouldn't want it. Um, and if I had that product, like how to market to them, did you choose that um, skill? You know, to an extent, I think some of it is innate. Some of it is like, just like Nate, it's like nature versus type. nurture type yeah. thing. Right. I think some of it is nature, but I also think that spending the first four or five years of my entrepreneurial career in marketing and having to think like a marketer has always made me now that I'm building software products makes me think about my software products through a marketer's lens. Like when I'm building a product, I'm thinking about how am I going to market and sell this once it's, once it exists. Mm -hmm. And I think thinking about it through that lens kind of allows me like a unique perspective versus if I was like a software engineer by trade, mm. you know, you might not be thinking through that same lens. Okay. And then what about uh, marketing as far as like yeah, the skill um, itself? Yeah, I think, I think marketing, I mean, it's, it's a very broad term, but like in software specifically, just understanding how and where and when to reach your target audience, like how to do activations, which channels to pick, how much to spend on things, like, you know, the, the little, like the little hacks, like the, like the, like hacking the organic TikTok algorithm for media mm -hmm. kits or, you know, you know, getting into Facebook groups and like, you know, doing organic, like guerrilla marketing on Facebook groups for my new company, like. Um, you know, understanding paid ads. I've spent like tens of millions of dollars on paid ads. Mm. Um, as a as a marketing agency, I got to manage like you know almost a hundred million dollars worth of ad budgets, and that gave me like a plethora of knowledge about like things like pay per click and and right. and Facebook ads. And so, um, I'm always just trying to kind of expand my skill set in like the realm of marketing and understand the different types of marketing, the different channels, how it's done. Um, but the most important thing is, is human psychology. That's the one thing that's never going to change. Say it louder. Right? So it's like the channel might change, the strategy might change, the tactics might change. The one thing that's never going to change is why does somebody buy something? 100%. If I started my YouTube channel when I was 20, would not be successful at all. But the fact that I was doing a marketing agency around 21, 22, that's where I learned to say, to make, like, optimize for understanding. In yeah. As few words as possible. Guys, and, go go study Brett's thumbnails and titles, go back and ask yourself, why did you click on this video? What made you click on this video? Like making thumbnails and titles on YouTube is a science and an art, but mainly a science. And it's like, that's marketing, like understanding, understanding what makes people want to click on a video like mm -hmm. in and of itself. So. I learned from Iman. Yeah. So. <laughs> e Iman is another, the best. I hope he's watching this. Cause we, we've shouted him out so many times, he's but yeah, best. He, he's he the, has best the best thumbnails, the thumbnails. best titles. Yeah. Every single person I tell. Absolutely. It's a clear point, you know, exactly who it's for and what you're getting out of it. And yeah. like seven words, 50 yeah. care. It's so impressive. Yeah. It's an art form, but that's what was, I was good at marketing, like messaging, yeah. Yeah. making people understand something really quickly. Yeah. But as far as like the tactics or the media buying or whatever, never my strong suit but the language. So yeah. that's a skill that has now translated to every business I've ever done or every aspect of my life that I've gone through. Yeah. And I, I, psychology is like my most, I just watch psychology videos all the time, yeah. all the time. It's one of the most interesting things for me to learn about. Um, I talked to Dan Coe the other day and he said, he told me about uh, the nine stages of ego development. Watch that. Cause you can like really, I will. Like that sounds interesting. Actualized.org. It's really interesting, dude. But this has been like a really, really like I don't know how else to put it because this wasn't like one where we were like getting like all like excited and hype and happy yeah. and like mind blown. But it's like that should be why this podcast is so valuable for people because it is so straightforward on yeah. how to build a successful SaaS platform. We've talked about so much too. Like we've kind of went like, all over the place. Yeah, I feel like there's so many nuggets in this. And again, I, I, I truly hope that people watching this like take something from this video and apply it to their lives and their businesses and, and, and do something with it and send us a message. If you do like, let, like, let us know that, um, you know, that you've taken it and, and, and applied it. So are there any YouTube channels that you're a big fan of right now? I mean, Hermosi, big one, um, Iman, of course, um, yours, Appreciate um, it. that's probably not helpful because you're already here. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, though I, I watch, I watch those and then, um, 
for SaaS, like Dan Martell makes good content. Okay. Um, he's a good like like kind of SaaS YouTube channel. So yeah. It, it seems pretty straightforward, dude. Yeah. Understand a, a job or a space, find a problem, try to fix it with software. How did you hire developers? Can I ask that real quick? Sure, Last yeah. One. Um, there, there's a bunch of great platforms to hire developers. You can find them on Upwork. Sometimes you can find good ones. Um, there's a platform called Lemon.io um, mm -hmm. that we've used in the past that's, that's really good. Um, if you can, like if you have the luxury of this, try to find them through your network. Like if you know anybody that has a software company um, or you, like, you, you know someone who's a software engineer, try to get them to send referrals your way. Mm -hmm. um, that's always gonna be the best way, mm -hmm. um, you know, just because they're gonna be a little bit more vetted and you're yeah. not completely going into it dark. Um, you know, and then another piece of advice is like, just try to have at least a baseline understanding about how software works. Um, and at like specifically like the types of languages that you're going to be building your product in, mm -hmm. you need to have like at least a baseline understanding. There's plenty of YouTube videos out there to teach you how like react native works or how a Node.js works or whatever it is. Just have like a baseline understanding so that you're not completely like confused by what's happening when you eventually do hire a developer. Yeah. I think, uh, Brandon always says to hire like a, uh, a, like a technical advisor yeah. for someone to help you hire. So exactly. Can, like, yeah. At least you can explain the idea to them, then they can explain it as like a translator yeah. almost. Yeah. Because yeah. I would be, people would take advantage of me if I just started talking. Dude, like, it happened at Media Kits, man. We, we went through two engineers that, that we burned so much money on and it just didn't work out. I don't know so. if I ever met a developer who's told me they can't do what I'm asking for. So yeah. just keep that in mind. They're all going to say they can do it better than the other guy. Yeah. And so you kind of have to really put those types of people to the test. Absolutely. But, or you just learn bubble. But uh, that is one thing I want to say. There's a really cool, I have a friend who literally started learning about bubble, like right when I started talking about it in January, within two months had a good grasp on it. And within two months after that had 25 K a month in bubble development agency clients. Wow. So not only can he use bubble to build his own SaaS, he can now cash flow a bubble dev agency. That's amazing. So I thought that was pretty interesting because that's a really fast come up and yeah. it's a good skill that's going to be relevant for a long time. But guys, follow Kieran. This camera's dead. Follow Kieran on all social media platforms. Kieran O'Brien, what is your main that you're most active on? Dude, none, honestly, right now. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint. Um, yeah, I mean, like Instagram, I'll post stuff here and there. Yeah, um, yeah I don't know. I, I think maybe the best way is to keep tabs on what I'm doing like with my companies. That's probably a better way to, to really learn versus like the content I put out because Again, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of in like monk mode right now, just kind of focus on the business. So, do you put a lot of focus on health, or like, like, are you not on social media specifically for like dopamine reasons? That and yeah, I mean, I'm doing 75 hard right now. Mm. It's my fourth time doing it. You look good. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I work out twice a day, so just Damn. don't have time to make content. To be honest, <laughs> have you like, but have you like consciously like put? This is something I actually do want to talk about real quick. Yeah, we're not saying goodbye yet. <laughs> it's like monk mode. You went to Bali for this. Like, how much? That is something that I actually neglected for a long time was like quality of food I was eating, how much dopamine can like using social media can affect your desire to do work. Is that something that you were big on at all? Or have you just been like, to an extent I, so de deleting social media off my phone has been a big one. Like the only, 100%. the only social media app I have on my phone is Facebook because that's where my customers are. Yeah, yeah. But like, there's no Instagram. Like if you search Instagram on my phone, like it doesn't exist. I think that's so. so yeah. I think the best advice I got from Alex Becker was don't put yourself in a position where you have to use willpower. Yeah. Just make it not an option. Yeah. And then you Dude, won't. same thing. Like, man, if there's a, if there's a box of Oreos in my, in my pantry, yeah. like I will eat it. If there's a, if there's a tub of ice cream in my freezer, I will eat the whole thing in one night. Why like, don't you, why don't you have Oreos? Why don't you eat ice cream? Well, that, that's the whole thing. Like I, I just don't let, let myself have them. Like if I really have a craving for something like that, like I'll get in my car and drive to like an ice cream shop and have like a little thing of ice cream. But like, yeah, I just try to keep my environment like conducive with the type of life I want to live. So I keep healthy food in my fridge. Mm -hmm. I keep social media off my phone. I don't, my phone is on my desk away from my bed. Like, you know, I, I, I just try to do what I can to control the controllables. Why is that important to control though? What, if you didn't, what would happen to you day to day life? I just notice like you, you just notice you're, you're more distracted. Uh, you like, you don't like, you don't, the, the dopamine hits kind of like you have to always search for more. Mm -hmm. So you spend way more time on these platforms. Like now when I do go on Instagram and like look at stuff or Twitter or whatever, like I'm going there, I'm seeing like a couple of my friends, a couple of things that I like, and I'm, that's good enough for me. Like mm -hmm. I don't need to keep like doom scrolling because I'm so used to not having it in my hand. It, it's just, it's little, they're designed to addict you. Yeah. Food, social media, video games, 
yeah. everything. So I don't know. Do you feel like there's, I feel like there's too much confidence on self-help out there, but it's just so like, it's like a fundamental thing. Yeah. And I always just ask my, like, I want to be a top performing person. So I, if I'm like feeling tempted, I'd be like, would a top performing person do this? No. And that way you just optimize every aspect of your life to yeah. get the most things done. Absolutely. And it's all just noise. Okay. Sorry. Side note. Yeah. I, everyone, every one of our friend group like has an extreme emphasis on that. Yeah. And I just want to point that out. Yeah. It's, it's a common denominator. I don't know a single person that is at our level that's eating like shit doing all this best no. stuff. So. We, ha- we have had our fair share of, uh, of dopamine and, you know, <laughs> nights out in Vegas, but, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, that, that's, but that's, that's to celebrate here know? and there, yeah, yeah. <laughs> here and there. But yeah, that's what you it do. is important to have fun is that my is point. 100%. That's what we do it for. Yeah. I love to have fun, yeah. but not in the work week or, and it's like phases, dude. It's yeah. phases of life. We're dragging this goodbye out. Okay, guys, Kieran, thank See you. See you later. Appreciate Thanks for watching, guys. Appreciate it. That was fun, bro.